We we'll call the April 6th City Council meeting to order. Commissioner Smith, you give us the prayer pledge and fact of the day, please, sir. I assume that through the prayer. Our Father, God, we come once again and say thank you for the many blessings that we enjoy. Thank you for all your goodness and the kindness you continue to shine upon us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be servants of yours, to serve this community, to make a difference in the lives of people. We ask your blessing and your guidance now as we continue to make decisions and protect the lives of all those in this city. We ask these blessings and pray for our very own city manager, Edward Bass, that you would touch his body from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Touch, Lord, as only you can. Heal them as only you can, if it's thy will. In thy son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fact of the day. On April 6, 1917, the United States entered World War I. After several years of Germany sinking many merchant and passenger ships belonging to the U.S. and Great Britain, as part of Germany's unrestricted warfare in war zone waters. World War I began in 1914 and finally ended November 11, 1918. More than 2 million American soldiers served in World War I, and of that, approximately 50,000 died on the battlefield. Back to the day. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Minutes, any corrections to the minutes? If not, look for a motion to approve. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Second. Langson, second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now, next up, our ladies in green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Popka Women's Club, I tell you, I, it's interesting. We go back, um, you know, having been born and raised in a Popka, I remember back when it was, gosh, when I was a kid, it was at the, um, was the old bowling alley, which was, where and I don't I don't even sure what's there now, what the, the business is, but on First and Washington, so almost 60 years ago is where it was held for four or five years I think, and be neat to get a couple pictures from those old days. I, I, matter of fact, I think my mom might even have a couple, but just you know for this being the 60th, that would be kind of a cool little where it, where it's come from and where it is today. So, with that, I want to read this proclamation. Um, Whereas the women, Apopka Women's Club was organized 65 years ago and has been instrumental in sponsoring the Apopka Art and Foliage Festival for many years. It's the city of Apopka's pleasure to be a part of the 60th Apopka Art and Foliage Festival 2022. And whereas the city of Apopka has long been known as the indoor foliage capital of the world, the Apopka Women's Club has expanded the foliage displays to attract a broader range of foliage enthusiasts making the Apopka Art and Foliage Festival one of the premier festivals in Central Florida. And whereas Kitland Nelson Park is the site of the 2022 Apopka Art and Foliage Festival, providing a scenic and welcoming atmosphere for the thousands of visitors to the festival, and whereas the City Council and the citizens of the City of Apopka want to recognize and commend the Apopka Women's Club for providing this family-oriented entertainment for our community, and whereas the City Council invites all citizens to join the Apopka Women's Club in extending a warm welcome to the many visitors during the 2022 Apopka Art and Foliage Festival. Now, therefore, I, Brian Nelson, Mayor of the City of Apopka, Florida, by virtue of the authority vested in me, City of Apopka, do hereby proclaim April 23rd and April 24th as Art and Foliage Festival Weekend. In the City of Apopka. Yeah. So who who'd like to come up and give us the what what's going to be happening on for the foliage files? Who's going to Jerry, Joanne? Give us the highlights for this year's festival. First, we want to thank the city for all the support you've given us this year. It's been really, really great. Um, one of the things that's not going to be happening at the fair at the festival this year is the crazy hats. We're not going to have crazy hats this year. <laughs> After 16 years, a woman who was chairman of it decided she needed a rest, so there won't <laughs> be any crazy hats this year. We're going to have a, a children's zone, which we're trying to make that more, uh, more things for the children to do. 
we're going to have entertainment, we're going to have some new concessionaires, we're having a vegan concession, concessionaire. We had a request for that last year because a lot of people don't eat meat. Uh, we're going to have uh, a new, new group from Mount Dora, our wine and uh, beer garden. They're going to be se um, selling mimosas too. <laughs> But those of us in the green shirts can't have them while we're working, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, in 1976, when the JCs and the Women's Club decided that they would join together to have the Art and Foliage Festival, I don't think they want, knew how this would go on and on and on, how important this would become in the, in the city. So we're very pleased to have the festival this year, our 60th anniversary, and we're really, really happy. Mm. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Why don't we go ahead, let's go ahead and get a picture. Everybody, we'll meet down front, see if we can get everybody crowded into a, a picture of all the ladies. You bet, this is awesome. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll see you. Our next presentation is an overview of the Public Safety Radio Improvements. Chief McKinley and Rich Steiner from Orange County Government are here to help us with that one. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, as the Mayor said, joining me is Rich Steiner with Orange County Government and their communications section. Um, he's going to give you the nuts and bolts of this improvement because if I tried to, I would uh, make an exact disaster of it. Uh, but we have been awarded $490,000 from Urban Area Security Initiative funding. If you're not familiar with what that is, is it's federal money that comes to those areas of the country that might be subject to terrorist activity or something like that. And obviously with Walt Disney World, we receive money in the Orlando area 
It goes through the Orange County Sheriff's Office. They have a committee that meets before we get the money, and that committee gets uh, applications from police, fire, and other entities that need that money to harden things or whatever. Um, we made an application with Rich's help and uh, Rob Hippler's help. I don't want to leave him out either. His team's done an instrumental part in helping us with our radio system since they took it over. Um, almost, I think, three years ago, and it's finally come to fruition, and I'm going to turn it over to Rich and let him explain to you exactly what the improvements are going to do for the city of Apopka and also everybody, all public safety in Orange County. So. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come out and talk to you today regarding the interlocal agreement. So during the third quarter of 2019, the uh, Orange County staff and the city of Pop Apopka staff started having meetings and discussions about combining our two independent radio systems. Um, these conversations and meetings came about from recommendations from the 2019 Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission report from January 2019. Um, based on the after action report from this commission and lessons learned from the events, it described the need for 911 centers to improve radio communications interoperability or the ability to share critical communications real time. It was mentioned in the report at the time, the local municipalities operated poorly under independent radio communication systems. So um, around August 2020, Chief McKinley and I and his staff, we began an effort with the Domestic Security Task Force to secure the half a million dollars that the chief mentioned. And uh, after lots of federal paperwork and a few presentations, we were successful. And these funds have now been released and are available for the city of Apopka to process the purchase order. So Orange County, the city of Orlando, and other cities within the county already combined systems back in 2013. Um, most recently, about six months ago, we signed a similar interlocal agreement with uh, Reedy Creek Improvement District, and Reedy Creek has also combined systems about four months ago. Um, Reedy Creek Improvement District operates five sites, the city of Orlando operates six, and Orange County operates 17 locations supporting radio communications for first responders and public safety. The largest mutual aid event demonstrating the success of a combined radio system was the unfortunate Pulse shooting events down, down in Orlando. Last year, the state of Florida actually passed another statute mandating direct radio communications between 911 public safety answering points and first responders. Regardless of discipline, police, sheriff, fire communications personnel must be able to communicate from comm center to comm center, your 911 center, and the units in the field on their primary talk groups. So the city of Apopka is compliant with this, but this new shared system and solution <clears throat> will enable better interoperability for all the agencies involved. The city of Apopka owns and operates a two tower solution and the proposed interlocal agreement before you today will combine with the county's 17 locations. And what this means to the first responders and public safety is that the personnel will roam seamlessly from site to site, much like you do with your smartphone. There's no inter you know, intervention on the public safety personnel's part. Uh, on the shared mutual aid talk groups that we have built out through the community, when there's a mass event, this extends to the city of Orlando's six locations in Reedy Creek. So once approved, the seamless system for all the 911 PSAPs in Orange County will operate under one single radio communications platform for better and improved interoperability. That's, that's really all I had today. Any, any questions for Mr. Steiner or for Chief how, McKinley? How soon will that uh, begin, that chair? That's up, that's up to Motorola. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're working with them. Uh, we are happy to say that Motorola, we got a quote from them two years ago and they've stuck to their quote from two years ago. Uh, I do want to mention something else real quick um, on behalf of, um, again, <clears throat> the great working relationship we have with Orange County and our own IT department. This project started out at $800,000 with Motorola. We're down to uh, $485,000 with Motorola. A lot of that because our IT department is going to take some of the load and Rich is offering his personnel to come over because every one of our radios and police and fire has got to be reprogrammed once we switch over to this system. So with Rich's help, Rob's help, we're able to reduce that to the amount that we got from UASI, because I'm not sure we would have gotten $800,000 from the UASI funds. Uh, so kudos to Rich, kudos to Rob for their assistance and you know their leverage of how important our public safety communication is. So that's with their help, we're able to get this done. We still got a long road ahead of us, um, but at least we're going to get there. So 
want to thank Rich and Rob both. Yeah, I just I think the communication is key, and I know that there's been a working together, especially as we've had needs even in South Apopka and the, the crossover there, and being able to communicate, you know, like that, I, it's just another great step forward. So thank you. Uh, I think it's an excellent idea, and uh, technology is always great, and anytime we can improve it and work together <laughs> with two different agencies, that's even better. So I All applaud right. you for your efforts, and thank you for your <laughs> assistance. No questions, uh, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Appreciate all your help on that. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Agenda review. I guess, Michael, anything, no changes, I don't think? No changes to the agenda. All right. Public comment. Susan? Good afternoon. I'm sure you've heard by now. My name is Gary McSweeney. I live on Spent Fisher Drive at, in Rock Springs Ridge. And last night, Rock Springs Ridge Homeowners Association held their annual meeting. And the results I wanted to share with you personally, although I'm sure you've heard them by now. <laughs> Word travels fast. Um, both Michelle Chase and I were reelected to uh, the board. Uh, John Drago, the third member, uh, his election is due next year. He's on the off year this year. Uh, David Marshall, who lives within, in Rock Springs Ridge, is a financial executive for an investment firm. Uh, he has also been elected to the board. And Bert Fairchild, who I believe you know yeah, here very yeah, well, or yeah. long term, yeah. um, uh, who has been a uh, HOA president, vice president, and treasurer for about a decade in various capacities uh, over at uh, Sweetwater in, uh, I believe, Seminole County. Uh, he will bring, and David Marshall will bring, a vast um, informative knowledge base of uh, financial uh, issues uh, to our uh, board. And uh, in particular, Marshall or Bert Fairchild will bring uh, a lot of experience on the board itself. So we look forward to rolling into that uh, scenario starting uh, next week when we go into our organizational uh, meeting and we will define which officer, who will be officers and in what positions and uh, work forward with uh, our goal of accomplishing uh, acquisition of the golf course uh, in due order. So um, there will be a change of uh, faces, there will be a changes, uh, changes of management perhaps, uh, attorneys as well. Um, we're trying to put the best face we can forward to uh, deal with the issues and uh, avoid uh, controversy almost on every level. So we have a solid board. And if you look at the um, petition drive we held a year and a half ago, two years ago now, uh, that had over 2,200 signatures in favor of us proceeding ahead in this group. <clears throat> when you look at the membership vote that was held in, in October, uh, that had an 82% approval of those voting for that, uh, for us to secure ownership of the golf course. I think that's pretty clear, and I think we have a, uh, a mandate from this vote, that, uh, from this election, that also says uh, we, the people of Rock Springs Ridge, support our effort to uh, achieve the goals of acquiring the golf course. So uh, we will be working with you, obviously, in the future. Uh, the golf group will be a part of this uh, as well, and uh, we look forward to a favorable outcome. And, and I know on uh, later today you have the tortoise resolution, and uh, I don't know what that will bring, but uh, we'll be interested in hearing it. And I just want to say a personal thanks to uh, Commissioner Becker uh, for uh, his uh, outstanding service here, and he, he's been a delight to our community, and uh, everybody speaks very favorable of him. So again, I want to just have a call out to you. Best of luck in your future endeavors, and thank you for helping our community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Was somebody else supposed to go? Because their comments are up on the screen. No? Okay. 
Well, they're up on the laptop, so. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sue Moyer, and I live at 530 Sand Wedge Loop in Apopka. I live in Rock Springs Ridge. I just wanted to make a comment about the vote last night. It's truly unfortunate that we had 323 people in Rock Springs vote on our board when we have 300 or 1,320. So less, just under 1,000 people did not vote for our board, which is really kind of pitiful. And I also want to address how the mandate, which Gary just stated of 82%, was not 82% of the homes in Rock Springs Ridge, only 53% of the homeowners actually voted in October. And so it was about 42% of the homes who voted in October, which they keep calling a mandate. I would like to continue to ask the city to enforce our PUD that we have for our Gopher Tortoise area. And I'm very glad that, or any of Rock Springs, so there is no building in Rock Springs at all because their new deal is including putting 300 townhomes within Rock Springs Ridge on the Gopher Tortoise land. So I'm hoping that the city stays strong and does not allow for any new development in Rock Springs Ridge, including 300 townhomes on the Gopher Tortoise area. And I'm glad that we are looking at a resolution for Gopher Tortoise Day, which is coming up this week. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Sylvester Hall. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, as, as a citizen, it's my determination to bring love and prosperity to the city of Apopka and to everybody. Um, one of the things I want to, one of the things I want to um, share with the the council here, last city council meeting, after the meeting was over with, I approached the mayor and I was reminding him the day of the election. I went up and I shook his hand. I shook this uh, campaigner's hand. And my words were to him and said, Mayor, regardless of who win or lose, we all are one. Regardless of who win or lose, we all are one. <laughs> the mayor stood up, looked at me, when he was already standing, he looked down over me, and he said, don't you ever question my character. Now, you don't really have to question people's character. They show you who their character is. But the thing that really bothered me was the way he looked at me, as if, as if I was a piece of garbage. I'm a man, I'm a citizen, and I'm a veteran. And I demand the same respect that you want for yourself, I, de I demand it for me. Now let's, let's clear up something on this character issue. People show you their character. When you failed to acknowledge Black History Month for the whole month of February during both city council meetings, you showed me your character. When I came down, and Commissioner Banks, and you can attest to this, I said, hey, look, we got a mayor who's leading the community but failed to acknowledge Black History Month for the whole month. Your exact words, if I can quote, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that's his can of worms. Uh, that's his. Uh, that's his problem. I, I don't need to. You know, I don't. You know. That's that's not my problem. I was very taken back by that because you're a man of God. I didn't say that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. If you didn't, if you didn't say it, one of us is not telling the truth. But that bothered me. That bothered me. The, um, let, me, let me go here. Mayor, when I got this letter from your wife, that showed me your character. You see how people show you their character? During the uh, city commissioner's debate, this is you. That showed me your character. When Commissioner 
Velasquez won her seat. You didn't congratulate her. You congratulated Nick Nestor, but you never congratulated her. During Woman's Week, we have a beautiful woman right here. Never acknowledged her accomplishment during Woman's Week. That showed me your character. When I showed you this map of the city of Apopka, how everything is annexed around South Apopka like South Apopka is cancer, you, sh you showed me your character. When we had the annexation meeting, you did not open the meeting, you did not close the meeting, and I don't recall you saying anything, but here's a picture of you during that meeting. That showed me your character. When I brought to you about we the people and democracy about the vote, you won the election with 10% of the 35,000 registered voters we have here in the city of Apopka. That is a threat to our democracy all over this country. When the people in Ukraine are, fight, are, are, are fighting a war, dying for a democracy, and you don't have a grasp for that, that showed me your character. So, Mayor, I say to you, principles matters, okay. procedures matters, right. integrity matters, leadership matters, responsibility matters, accountability matters, morals matters, laws matters, ethics matters, and character matters. Thank you, sir. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. <clears throat> My name is David Hoffman. I live at Tayside Court, Rock Springs Ridge. Yesterday, Ukrainian, Ukrainian President Zelensky came down like a ton of bricks on the UN General Assembly for engaging in empty rhetoric rather than a powerful material action to support his beleaguered nation and people as they struggle to subvert, preserve democracy against unfathomable evil unhinged totalitarian dictator Putin. Innocent citizens are being executed en masse for merely trying to protect their homes, their children, their families. By contrast, here in America, we witnessed large swaths of our population supporting a totalitarian wannabe, declaring that Vladimir Putin is a genius, a great leader, with vast expanses of the extremist media singing hosannas to both agents of evil. As Ukraine descends through its tragic grip of war, ascends, I should say, America descends in the grip of division and acrimony, engendered ironically by the two most dangerous threats to democracy worldwide. The theme here is democracy. I propose that Apopka City take a remarkable step to advance democracy in Ukraine and reassert, reassert democracy here in this city, such as it ever was, by passing an action, actionable resolution to support the suffering people of Ukraine, and by launching a fundraiser to send material to support to these inspirational fighters. Furthermore, I propose that a trademark baseball cap, as baseball season is about to start, be created in Ukrainian blue, with the yellow letters S-U-N, embroidered on the front, support Ukraine now, accompanied by a replica of a Ukrainian flag. The humanitarian action, this humanitarian action would signal a new commitment to democracy here at City Hall, serving as an inspirational vanguard effort that would be bound to gain national attention and honor for backing a trend line in Florida and the Deep South where democracy is under assault. Such an action will be concomitant with three successful at-bat hits for democracy at Rock Springs Ridge in the past year and a half, an impressive petition drive in October 2020 an overwhelming October 4th, 2021 vote to sell the 51-acre preserve and provide funds for the purchase of the golf course, and the overwhelming approval last evening of a slate of HOA board candidates dedicated to the mission of saving and preserving Rock Springs Ridge, democracy on full display. 
Our citizens have spoken. Congratulations to Gary McSweeney and Michelle Chase, Bert Fairchild, and David Marshall, who have promised to fulfill this goal. You folks at City Hall are invited to come up and learn from our Rock Springs Ridge Clinic on democracy. You might like it. Thank you, Charlton. Is that it? Okay. Uh, under the consent item, we just have just the one item. It's um, just replacing a fire department uh, squad truck that motor blew up. Uh, looking for a motion to approve the consent I, agenda. I did have a question on sure. that. Sure. Uh, Chief, you want to come down real quick? <clears throat> I was just curious because it said that the motor blew up, but it was 20000 to replace the motor, and that just seemed extensive. Is it because there's a specialty purpose in it, or is that just? No, that's just the, that's the cost literal. of replacing <laughs> Believe it or not, to fix the motor. The exact uh, amount was $20,141.25. <laughs> <laughs> so. I guess I'm remembering the old days when I <laughs> <laughs> flipped <laughs> motors in my Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other yeah, questions for Chief been... while we got them up here? Yeah, I, I, you know, we lost an ambulance last week as well. So yes. we've got a, and, and just so while, while you got, I got you up here, is what, 12 months? Lead time now for the ambulance that just we just oh, yeah the, 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 this truck alone the F one fifties we were told is um, October of two thousand twenty three before we can purchase another one through the normal procurement process two um, fifties are November the ambulance was going to be we couldn't order one we had to get in line basically with the intent to procure agreement that we couldn't order until March of two thousand twenty three and it's eighteen months from what order date till we would actually receive the ambulance so we're really Finding unique ways to get get our jobs done. Yeah. So, crazy. Yeah. Any other questions for the chief? Okay. That look for a motion to approve the one consent agenda item. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, Bobby Howe. Acuria. Is that how you say it? Aquara Estates. Aquara States. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, Commission. Bobby Howell, Planning Manager. Major development plan has been submitted for a residential subdivision consisting of 76 single-family units developed in one phase. The property is located west of Jason Dwelly Parkway and adjacent to the Orchid Estate subdivision and is zoned RSF-1B. The property was rezoned approximately last summer to that RSF-1B designation. The applicant is proposing a minimum lot area of 9,750 square feet. Access is proposed by a Tigris Drive. The internal streets will be dedicated to the public. Five-foot-wide sidewalks are provided on both sides of the internal streets. A 155-foot-long right turn lane leading from Jason Dwelly Parkway to Tigris Drive is proposed as part of the site construction. Additionally, a 205-foot-long left turn lane leading from Jason Dwelly Parkway to Tigris Drive is proposed as part of the site construction as well. Two stormwater ponds are proposed in tracks that are owned and maintained by the Homeowners Association. The applicant is proposing a tot lot on track Rec 1, in addition to passive open space that is located on this tract. The tract is owned and maintained by the Homeowners Association. The Development Review Committee recommends approval. The Planning Commission unanimously recommends approval. And the recommended motion this afternoon is to approve the Aquara State's Major Development Plan. Uh, staff and applicant are available for questions. Questions for Bobby? Yeah, um, where, where's the, um, so it's going to be one phase. Um, obviously, it straddles Tiger's Drive, and Tiger's Drive is utilized by Orchid Estates currently. Um, is it going to be a simultaneous development, or are they going to do the north side first, then south side, or is it truly just going to be all done at once? I couldn't let the applicant test okay. that question. That's probably more for staging of construction and stuff. If, if Any all. other questions for Bobby before we bring up the applicant? Yeah. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Corey Sittler with uh, Kimberly Horn and Associates. I'm the engineer of record, uh, 5107 Laval Drive, Orlando, Florida. Um, we're still talking about whether the, the project, project is going to be one phase or two phases. Uh, if, if it is multiple phases, Tigris is, is likely going to be the, um, the, I guess, break point between the two. Um, I will say that Orchid Estates does have another entrance on the north side mm -hmm. um, that's probably the main entrance for southbound traffic. Um, so that's uh, and then 
I see where there's going to be a, a new turn lane into Tigris. Is, can that be done towards the, the front end of that project? Because already, if you normal behaviors of people that live in Orchid Estates currently, you can tell that they're already going over that median structure. Yeah, you can, I can see the aerials. Yeah. <laughs> so it, when are you planning on constructing that during the construction process? Um, I haven't been able to talk to the uh, developer or um, home builder about that okay. specifically. Um, we're kind of still um, in the talks of e if it even is going to be phased. Um, so if that's if that's a preference of city council, um, you know, we can definitely talk to the developer and the home builder about that. I, I think the ease of ingress egress would be if we can prioritize it to be on the front mm -hmm. end versus the tail end. I think that would be preferred. Sure. Um, sure. And the, the last uh, question I had is on the plan, especially the tree plan. It looks like you've got a lot of planting, almost what I would perceive to be in the, the right of way, the sidewalk between the sidewalk and the curb. Is that, am I looking at that correctly? Because, you know, I, I don't have to go too far. Like Pines of Wakaiva, it presents a whole slew of issues when you plant trees in that, in that section of the development. So is, is that accurate? Is that the plan? Because I would encourage not to do that. Yeah, so currently we're, we are showing um, street trees in between the sidewalk and the curb, and that was just to satisfy the city's street tree requirement. Um, there's not really another place to put it in addition to the, uh, the landscaping requirements in the lots. Are those oaks? Because I can't, because on the circle, it almost looks on the legend that they're oaks, but. <clears throat> those won't be oaks. Uh, you know, obviously, because obviously with the root structure and stuff yeah, yeah, with the yeah. sidewalk and the road, you're going to run into problems. Yeah, exactly. Our, our land development code does not encourage oak trees for street trees, so it'll be a different variety that's more, less root aggressive. Mm -hmm. I know Jean's got one coming up a little later, and we'll have her kind of, she can go into, kind of delve into the street trees, because, yeah, we're, we're doing a major kind of rewrite on street trees. Yep. So and we this, don't was, this was brought up with staff um, during the MDP phase, and they did comment, uh, engineering, I believe, commented on it. Um, we are gonna we are gonna have root barriers um, on the trees so that there's not any um, so that there's less impacts to, to sidewalk and curb infrastructure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing and look for a motion to approve the Acura Estates Major Development Plan. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, Mid Florida Logistics, Lot 2. This is a major development plan for a uh, property located at 3101 Shelby Industrial Drive, which is a lot, Mid Florida Logistics Park, Lot 2. Details the development of an industrial building totaling 138,500 square feet in area. The property is on 16.66 acres. Proposed use of the building is a laundry facility for Lowe's Hotels. The area on the east side of the building is set aside for future development and expansion of the building in case they need it. A total of 150 regular and truck parking spaces are provided on site. Stormwater is proposed to be discharged into the master stormwater pond for the Mid Florida Logistics Park. The architectural elevation of the building is consistent with what's currently out in the park. And the DRC recommends approval. The Planning Commission unanimously recommends approval. And the recommended motion this afternoon is to approve the lot two major development plan. Staff and the applicant are here for questions. Any questions for Bobby? My only question is about um, water volume. Obviously, mm -hmm. with this being a laundry, um, we saw the challenges that we had when Anuvia came online and some of the issues that that presented. Um, have you all contemplated that um, and made sure that we have the capacity to be able to process whatever um, discharge that they have from, the, from their operation? Yes, sir. During the DRC review process, uh, public services looked into all that and uh, made the assumption there was enough water to handle the mm -hmm. facility. I don't even think we have anybody from public services here, do we? Made, made the assumption or confirmed? And they confirmed through their okay. work that they do have it, that studies were turned in to show the mm -hmm. amount of water that was used on this facility. Okay. I know this isn't under this purview, but is there any indication how many jobs that this is going to create? Um, Bruce, maybe the applicant want to. <laughs> it's okay if you don't have it. <laughs> any, any other questions for Bobby? If not, we'll have the applicant come forward and maybe try to answer that question for you. Good afternoon. Uh, Honey, are you 6800 Liquid Plaza Drive with Lowe's Hotels? 
so this facility is going to do, as Bobby said, um, hotels, uh, linen as a commercial laundry, and it's going to do what presently open and also with future growth. Um, at the beginning, uh, we're looking at about um, 100 to 120 team members oh, wow. working. Uh, mm -hmm. So that means it could go up to 200, 250 open positions to be able to maintain that number. Excellent. Wow. Okay. Will that process be simply through Lowe's that people would go online to begin to pursue that? Uh, that is correct. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Any, any other questions for the applicant? Well, I mean, it was a, a good question about how many jobs it's going to bring, but I guess the thing that we need to start addressing how many residents of the city of Apopka is going to be employed. Mm. Uh, as much as we can. Uh, all right. <laughs> any other questions for the applicant? All right. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Uh, if not, we'll close the public hearing. I, I do want to... Excuse me. Yeah. I don't want to speak to this matter, but I will speak to another matter. Earlier, I stood up here. I proposed a resolution be taken up by the city. There was no response whatsoever to what I said. Last week, Sue Moore, or the last meeting, Sue Moore came up here and proposed a resolution regarding the tortoise day uh, here in Florida on, in April. You people are all Can over I have a that point of like order? Bees? This is yeah, not like, part like, of this particular yeah, piece of business. Um, I would suggest that the speaker just okay. cease all right. the comment. The point is, point of no order. response to that, and I think I that's I wrong. Point, point of order to the chair. Okay. Okay. Um, well, before we close and vote on this this motion, I, I do want to let everybody know that uh, Bobby Howell has taken up a position with Lake County. He's going to be the head of their planning department, and uh, we we wish him well. I mean, it's a it's a great you know great advancement for him, and and so we uh, we thank him for what six five and a half years, years. Five, almost six <laughs> years of service. So thank you, Bobby, for for what you've done to. Thank you, to, Mayor. To push, push. Commissioners, it's been an honor to serve with you. I really enjoyed my time. Yeah. So I'll yeah. miss all of you. Well, you'll be missed for sure. Yes, he will. I spoke to him <laughs> yesterday. Okay. With that, I look for a motion to approve the Mid Florida Logistics Park Lot 2 major development plan. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion Aye. carries unanimously. Next up, Chief McKinley. This is the accepted, I guess we just, just a formality, you wanna? I mean, this is an action item versus a presentation. <laughs> Mayor, commissioners, uh, I apologize because I actually meant to say it before I sat down the first time, but <clears throat> what we do need to, <coughs> is for the um, allow for y'all to accept the mayor to sign an agreement with Orange County to have them work with us on improving our radio system and also with the Orange County Sheriff's Office to accept the um, $490,000 in UAC funds. So it is an action item that needs to be uh, voted on by y'all so that the mayor can sign those two agreements that were in the package. Any questions for Chief? <clears throat> Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not will close the public hearing and look for a motion to authorize the mayor to sign an agreement with the Orange County Sheriff's Office to accept, receive urban area security initiative UASI funding and enter into an agreement with Orange County government to upgrade the city's public safety communications system. So, so moved. moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez, second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, Pam, the local. Florida Department of Transportation agreement. Uh, let me start by saying I'm not happy to be standing here having to talk to you about this. When I came in front of y'all um, September 9th of 2021, we were enthusiastic about this $30,000 agreement we had with DOT to, um, when they do the, the resurfacing project on 441 from Bradshaw to Central, we we're gonna continue the pattern sidewalks and at Central, we were going to put the decorative crosswalk like we did at <clears throat> McGee, you know, in a, in, as we start beautifying downtown. DOT, um, as you'll recall, as part of that resurfacing, they're going to add <clears throat> medians for us. Other things that they're doing for us is adding um, conduit so that we can 
run um, electric and um, irrigation out or whatever kind of landscaping and lighting that we choose to do. While they did their cost estimates last summer and when the cost estimates came in, this was the original cost estimate and we got a, like a $12,000 discount because of the difference in the, the software that they used to make the estimate and what um, actual cost they were seeing for the, the stamped um, sidewalks. Um, so this is what the cost came in six or eight months later. The, the bidder that, that was awarded this contract to do these two things for us, it came in at $104,000, up from $45,000. And that's a lot of money. And so our share of that went from um, $30,000 to 60, 61000 61.5 additional dollars to do the sidewalk and the crosswalk. And so I have made this recommendation that we just do the sidewalks and ask DOT for a, to give us, they, we've already paid them the $30,000 because that was required and that's what it was going to cost us to do everything. Um, it's your decision if we decide to continue this, it will cost us, in addition to the 30000 that we've paid, $61,500 additional. It's for y'all to decide, do you want to pay the difference and do everything, or should we go? We can, with DOT, we have the option to just cancel the agreement. Or what I've recommended is we just, just do the sidewalks, because some of them are already done, and. Um, that would cost us about $26,000, um, and we would get $4,000 back. So I'm... Um, yeah, so she just basically got, if you see in your, your staff report, you got three options. And so she, she, I just told her to bring all three options, and she, she brings, bringing us three options. Um, we do have money in the budget. We do have money in the department. I won't... Obviously, it's going to take from something else that we might want to do, other sidewalks and other, you know, road improvements. But you can't take um, impact fee dollars because this is not a, a road uh, enhancement. It's just the a capacity. road improvement. It's so it's it has to come out of our operating budget. So can, got, if I can just add to the, <clears throat> the, the resurfacing project, it went from $2 million to $3 million. So it wasn't just us. I think ours disproportionately went up, but I, I can't say that for sure without seeing the rest of it. And DOT is still going to do that project for us. So I guess my point is it's not just us. It's everything, and it's, it's affecting everything I do right now because I don't know if I have enough money for cost estimates I made last year when I go to construction this year. So this is kind of the beginning but we are going forward with the project one way or another, just maybe not this part of it. Can I get a point of clarity? The, what you had up there before, <clears throat> the sidewalks aren't pavers, though. No. It's so all the rest of them are stamped concrete. Stamped concrete, architectural concrete. It's, it's, it's the, the cost estimate is for um, whichever one was cheaper. They'll look just like the ones that are out there now. So this is not like an upgrade to what we already have. And the and the crosswalks down here are in fact stamped concrete. They're the, not brick. The crosswalks. Are you talking the about papers. the sidewalks or the crosswalks? Crosswalks. The crosswalks. What we have already is stamped concrete. Right. I mean, I, me personally, it's my own opinion. I've never particularly cared for the pink sidewalks, anyways. Um, okay. I'd prefer to have the crosswalks look more consistent. Wait a minute, so, so you'd like to do what now? I'm sorry. I, I think the crosswalks, I mean, the, the crosswalk at McGee looks a lot nicer than those pink kind of stamped concrete sidewalks. You know, yeah, the, the, aesthetically, what people are going to see the most as they're driving are going to see, and pedestrians for that matter, when they cross over it, will be the crosswalks. So you'd rather see us do the... Um, crosswalks versus the, crosswalks. the sidewalks. And Assuming so, that the sidewalks are in good condition. Good condition. So if we just did the crosswalks and not the sidewalks, it would cost um, <clears throat> I wrote it in here. 
additional um, 34745. Thank you. Yeah. Because <laughs> if because ultimately if you're try trying to build some continuity into the aesthetics yeah. of our city, I mean, I don't want to sacrifice that just because, you know, it's got a money aspect to it. If it, if that's the cost of doing it at this point, it's the cost of doing it. I just want to make sure that it looks the best possible. Um, and again, my opinion is I've never really liked the the look of the sidewalks with that stamped concrete with the pink. Um, I'd rather have the car, the crosswalk. I mean, that, that's how my thoughts tended to lean because there's a uniformity and, and it's bringing, uh, it, it brings the, the better word, the ambiance, the, you know, the level of the city up to a place where we're aiming at. I, I think that's something that if we don't do it now, it's going to be a lot more expensive if we ever did try and add it later. So even though it's a, a little bit of a bite of the budget, I think it's still less expensive than if we try to do it later. Otherwise, we have one street in town that does that. Here, it's kind of balancing bookends of our downtown area, and I think it, there's a uniformity that, that looks nice by doing it that way. I, there, there, there are other options, too. You know, we could look around and see if we could find someone to do it cheaper. The original plan was just to let DOT do it, economy of scale, it'd be cheaper. But I, right here, I, I can't say for certain that we could find someone to do it cheaper. Maybe we could, maybe we couldn't. Do we have time to pursue that? I mean, that's always better as long as it's the same quality. Well, we would have to say no and then live with whatever our decisions. They've already bid this out. They're, they're going to be turning dirt in June. Well, we can if if it's under fifty thousand, though we could get three, three quotes, right? So we could we could rush out there and try to get three quotes. We also have we are piggybacking on the Seminole County construction contract mm -hmm. for projects less than two million, um, and they have contractors in there that um, do this kind of work, and I could thumb through those and see, you know, okay. where those costs are locked <clears throat> in um, and see what it would cost to use someone else to do it. I did look at one contractor and it, it came in um, uh, a little lower than what it would cost to have, uh, I think it's Hubbard is the one that won this bid to, to have them do it. And, and honestly, if there's no economy of scale, if we're not getting a discount, and is it going to be hard to coordinate? Is it going to be hard to coordinate the DOT? We would just have to do that? it after. We'd let them come in and do their stuff, and then we'd schedule ours to go in right after that. Oh, so we'd just cut back the payment out. Just yeah. Start. So just, the bid just, would show the additional expense of them having to do that, so we can truly compare apples to apples. No, we would just take it out of this agreement and then do ours. But I mean, when we we want to know ahead of time if they're going to charge us the same amount, but then they're going to charge us extra to cut it out and relay it then that's going to end up being more expensive. And Right, but I, what I'm saying to you is I did go through the, the Seminole County contract and I found one of the contractors that could do it a little bit less than, than this one. I think it's, I think it, if it's not a lot less, I it's, think it's, it's not, yeah, it's not right. a lot you're less. You're going to be, yeah, because so, if you're not talking about a lot less, yeah. when you pay to have them to come back and undo <laughs> what <laughs> the state's already it. done, yeah. now we're going to be, yeah. Yeah. In excess yeah. of what we'd originally done, and by doing that, are we going to delay the project? Um, no, we're not going to delay. DOT will not allow us to delay that. <laughs> All right. So then, it's in our best interest then to go ahead and well, well, let me do say the this, crosswalks. The, the the crosswalks they don't tear up the road. They place them on top. When they did McGee, they had resurfaced the road, and then they came in and laid those um, the stamped concrete on top. So it's got a little texture to it. But they didn't dig up the crosswalks. They put those in after they had resurfaced the road. They put them on top and then put the thermoplastic striping on top of it. Right, but if we don't do it when they do it, they're not going to leave it open for us to come no, in later. No, they'll resurface it, and then we'll just come in and do the striping and add those on top. There's no destruction is what I'm saying. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll resurface it, and they'll do the standard striping and crosswalks. That will have to be sandblasted off or scraped off. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Velasquez, you have a question? No, they've, they've asked all the questions. So at this point, it's deciding what, what we to want. stay with what we have or 
to eliminate uh, and go with what you're saying, the piggy bank over piggyback at uh, Seminole. Well, that's just for that. that yeah, that would be board. separate. We would yeah, have yeah. to, I would have to recommend to you that you um, say let's, well, and assuming you don't want to do the sidewalks, too, yeah. that we would just void our contract with DOT and figure out some way to do this on our own. We'll get our $30,000 back and... <clears throat> Well, it sounds like we're no, that's not the yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. not what I'm proposing. Yeah. I'm proposing that we do not do the sidewalks, but allow them to go ahead and do the crosswalks, right. mm -hmm. and we just pay the difference. Yeah. Thirty-four thousand yeah. dollars. Yes. Yeah. And I've already talked to DOT about it, and we can okay. modify this any way that we Perfect. want. Okay. Okay. All and right. So we're not doing the sidewalks, but we're doing the crosswalks. That's right. So and this, that's what I have up there. I just. Put the thing on there that cost y'all the least amount of money because it's not my money to spend. <laughs> um, so instead of this motion, it will be to um, keep in the uh, pattern pavement crosswalks and remove the um, the sidewalks from the yeah. agreement and well. pay an additional thirty-four thousand. Um, 745. Thank you. I found it faster. <laughs> For just the uh, crosswalks. Okay. Just do the crosswalks. Yeah. Well, before okay. we do that, let's let's ask if anybody in the public wants to speak on this matter. Okay, nobody wants to speak. So, okay, so I'm looking for a motion. Mr. Becker, you want to yeah. kind of let this out with that? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I move to uh, go forward with the pattern pavement crosswalks and instead of the sidewalk improvements mm -hmm. okay with the amount um in question okay so got a motion by commissioner becker second second by commissioner smith all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all opposed motion carries unanimously all right michael Good afternoon. The item before you uh, presently is staff's request for authorization to conduct negotiations with the property owner of the property located at 27 North Binion Road, or uh, more commonly, this is the property on the north shore of Shepherd Lake abutting, uh, abutting Camp Weewa on the north side. At the present time, uh, there is a draft agreement that has been completed for presentation to the property owner as the city's offer um, to purchase the property. At this point, we want to get the council's authorization to present that offer and begin negotiations for the purchase of the property. The current draft is that it is going to be offered at its appraised value. Um, it's a standard purchase and sale agreement um, when it comes to real estate property on the part. It's similar to agreements that we have done. Um, actually, structurally and substantially, it's similar to the agreement done for the purchase of, the camp, of camp Weewa. The only difference is that we have included an environmental contingency in the contract, which provides for three separate options in the event that the environmental audits and reports for the property show a level of environmental condition that may or may not be acceptable to the city. So at this time, the request is for authorization to proceed forward to negotiate for the purchase of the property. Not to actually purchase it, just yeah, to well, negotiate. <laughs> I'm sensitive to the word uh, negotiate. I'm, I'm a little gun shy off the last RFP conversation. But what I do want to say, and, and again, I, I can respect the idea of negotiations, and then it'll come back. And this will be something that probably the person that sits in the seat after me will, will determine, because I'm assuming that's going to be kind of a 30-day process. What I, would, what I would encourage my uh, successor to consider in this council um, is do we have a picture of what the full cost of this acquisition and ownership will be long term. So yeah, we're going to pay for it, but a general guidance of how much, if it is the property is contaminated, how much money we're going to, have to sink into that and what the cost of, of any improvements that are planned for this piece of property once we acquire it, if we, if we do. Well, one of the contingencies that is going to be presented to the, the property owner that is in the event that this ends up being a property that qualifies for ground, uh, brownfields incentives, in which there may be incentive and monies that'll be, offered, that'll be provided by the state. 
one of the contingencies is that if the costs of the brownfields remediation exceeds the amount of the incentive incentivized funding that we receive from the state, that actually the property owner is going to make up that difference, and that difference will be credited to the city as part of the uh, purchase price. Okay. That's one of the contingencies. We have other contingencies where um, there is a unilateral right on the part of the city where if this is something that is just not going to work, then the, the under the environmental contingency, the city can terminate the agreement, um, and the the price of terminating the agreement will be the the surrendering of the deposit to the to the property owner. But it does give the city a unilateral right to <clears throat> get out of the agreement if it comes back and this is just completely untenable. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, my only concern is, um, you know. When we first contemplated the purchase of Camp Wee Wah, you know, we had a gentleman come in here several times mm -hmm. and try and pitch this idea. We didn't take him up on that offer, and yet the market has appreciated in a manner this is going to be more costly than it would have probably been a year ago. Um, and we've also got other capital concerns that we need. I mean, this is an eight hundred thousand dollar expenditure, seven sixty five or seven sixty eight. Um, expenditure when we got, you know, a couple meetings ago, we were, and this is, I'm looking at you, but this is really a conversation for the council. Um, you know, $30 million in, in desired upgrades for our parks and rec space. You know, we've had a couple budget hearings the past couple years where we've needed a fleet maintenance, million and a half dollar building. You know, there's a lot of capital needs in our city to be exploring kind of add on land that's serves really no purpose right now for the city, and it's going to take a lot for us to mitigate um, its current form to get it into a useful life. So I just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not trying to deter our next step forward and putting the piece of paper in front of the property owner. I just, you know, there's legitimate concerns about if we're going to spend $800,000 on something like this, we're taking it away from other areas, so. Will we know about the contamination before the purchase? Yes, well, the, uh, pursuant to the agreement, the property owner has to provide us with all environmental studies and environmental reports as part of the contract. So we will know prior to the closing what the reports state, and then at that point, how we can address the environmental concerns, if any. Um, those are all laid out as part of the environmental contingency in the contract. All right. Mr. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that's healthy uh, logic. To look at that, my first question is, what is the purpose and benefit to the city? What are we looking at? Why would we do this? How does that outweigh the potential, we could put this money elsewhere uh, thought? Because again, I agree, there's lots of things that we can and need to do. Um, obviously, there's a green space uh, that's a value that we need to keep. And we have, I think we're, we're over in our amount of acreage that we need for that. But that puts us in a good spot uh, concerning other development. But I know it was proposed or mentioned that it can be a use for the citizens here with Camp Weewa when it's utilized yes. by someone else coming in. This can be something our citizens can use consistently. Year, year, year round. Yeah, that, that, for me, I think that's the big, big advantage of having this piece of property is that you know, it's a, there's a real small area between Camp Weewa and this property that you could fence off. So if you have summer camps where you obviously have to have restricted access, which means our citizens can't use that property. It would give you access to Shepherd Lake, Lake Shepherd. Um, and then when, when there weren't any overnight campers, then you could open up that gate and, and go between Camp Weewa and this piece of property. So I think, to me, that's the, that's the, the advantage. I mean, it's um, obviously being next door to Camp Weewa, there, there's that advantage as well. But, yeah, it's it's a... That's the reason I, I think it's it's something it's appropriate to at least take a you know take a look at it and see if we can't figure out a way to buy it because obviously it's it's you know they need to sell it and uh, now that it's into an estate it, so I think it's the timing is right and again it is appreciable land and as yeah. it is appreciating yeah. it it should continue to do so so that's still an asset to the city so it's trading li trading liquid funds for asset you know at that point if we decided it, this really isn't beneficial for us we need to utilize it elsewhere. Uh, how much of that is usable land? I know it's 20.126 acres. No, I, I believe it's, I think it's 28. I think it was eight. I want to say eight. Well, I thought I had the square footage from the property appraisers. I can't, off the top of my head, I can't remember of, of the 20.56. I thought, yeah, so it the, might be eight. It's less than, 
less than eight are, are not submerged. The agriculture portion is uh, 8.69 acres. Okay. There's a single family out of an acre, and then submerged is 10.44. So you're, you're looking at about nine and a half acres. About nine and a half. Okay. And it's all uh, waterfront. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's it's lakefront property, but uh, I would just be <laughs> curious to know how did we uh, arrive at this number? Is that consistent with the appraisal we got? The acreage uh -huh. comes from the from the both the appraisal as well as the information that the property appraiser has. So my question is that uh, when this was presented much earlier, uh, a spokesperson for the owner had said that earlier they had uh, they had a buyer for it, and somehow it, the, the deal kind of fell through and it was proposed as a residential. And so at this point, with us considering it a negotiation, um, now we're we're keeping the owner of that property to kind of wait to decide, uh, well, do we want it or we don't want it, um, when they may have an opportunity to, uh, to sell their property. So what, how long is the process? And is the owner still interested um, in trying to sell it as privately rather than with the city? Because I. I haven't seen the owner here. I've only seen, you know, uh, the she, spokesperson. She, she's, she's not really, I don't think. But we have, well, when it's time for, mm -hmm. I mean, we do have uh, Mr. Dennis New who has come up continuously and spoken for the owner. So at, at this point, um, before I can even agree to let's negotiate, was is she still interested in doing something other than uh, selling it to us? Because... How long is the process before we, with the environmental study and everything? I mean, how long are we asking well, her to hold you, on to that property? Well, now you're at, you're on you're on two separate time frames here. If, okay. Because you're, if we negotiate and a contract is signed, then the timelines are governed by the contract. Okay. So the part of the property owner has agreed to execute the contract. So we're not holding up anything. The property owner has consented to entering into the contract and the timelines that are presented in the contract. Okay. So it is at this point is we're going to go forward to I, because this is the city's action. I want the authorization of the council that is the, the desire of the council to present the contract and offer to the property owner to either accept it or deny it. That's that's the property owner's prerogative. Um, but I want the city's authorization to, to present that contract and that offer to the property owner for to accept or to decline. Then once, if the property owner accepts the contract, now the contract is going to govern the timelines for when the reports need to be, when we they need to submit. What are the time frames where if the environmental reports don't, don't come in or don't jive, that, that either party is going to have the opportunity to, to terminate the contract, as well as the other regular contingencies that are in a purchase, in a purchase and sale agreement of this kind. Okay, we've got the, the uh, well, broker of the, the deal. Do you want to just have him come up? Sure. Commissioner Vasquez. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm Rick Gonzalez with Crosby and Associates. Um, yes, the owner would like to discuss this with the city. We did have previous buyers uh, look at the property. And personally, I think, I think the highest and best use is a townhome community, but the city has expressed a, a uh, the planning department, I guess informally, said they didn't want townhomes there. So that went by the mm -hmm. wayside even though it's allowed under the code. Um, so we're back to, and it, it is being advertised for sale. And so it is being offered to the public and it's being offered to the city. So. Can we clarify that, Mark, remark? Yeah. Uh, what's Staff's point of view on what he just said? Because that's important for me. The, uh, well, the it was my reading of the what's allowed. It's got a future land use of office, which I think is sort of the wrong future land use. but. That's the way it is. And under office, if you look at the matrix, townhomes are checked as a allowable use. Okay, Jim, a, you want town, to... a developer went to the city and got the informal read that they didn't like that idea. So that's... Jim, that's Jim you want to... Sure, I can address that. The, uh, the, the, it, it's a fairly compact uh, property. Uh, basically, entrance either you know, probably off of... Um, 
off of a, a Duncove Drive. Um, it's a curved, it's also a curved entrance off of uh, Binion Road. But the, the project, the way it was presented, did not meet code. Um, in other words, we do have that uh, requirement about rear loaded lots if they're less than 50 feet, and townhomes are obviously less than 50 feet. And all the other subdivisions that we've got are meeting code. So you have your main road, and then you have your back um, access uh, drive where the uh, where the garages would be, and they didn't even come <coughs> close to what what we've been looking at for meeting our code. So was the point of contention it's, it's the the concept and layout, or was it the use of townhomes? Concept and layout, but it also, if you look at the area, you all, we also look at compatibility with the surrounding area. There are no other multifamily developments in that area. It's all single family. Yeah, yeah. Then it, it doesn't it doesn't match the consistency of the of the of what you have in the area for the single family development and the park across the street or across the lake. <laughs> Okay. Speak? Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Sorry, one, one last thing on there. I'll press a little bit further on that one. Um, <clears throat> but at the staff level, the compatibility, is that something that staff has unilateral authority to determine? Because, you know, obviously a lot of these areas were agricultural at one time, but yet the first single family. Uh, development that came in, it was the first one around a whole bunch of ag, so it wouldn't have been compatible. So, you know, I get what you're saying, but at what point does it have a higher level of scrutiny for it to go through the process? Because if code-wise, that designation, future land use designation on that piece of property allows for the type of townhome product, then it becomes a concept, you know, rear load, spacing, setbacks, this, that, and the other. Right. To me, that th would be allowed to go through the process, DRC planning, uh, all the way up to city council. Um, you know, and make that determination through that process. Well, staff does have some some discretion in terms of what we would we would be comfortable with recommending for a development. The concept that was presented to us was one concept, and it did not come close to meeting code and what we've come to expect uh, a reaction from from city council. We always say you're welcome to submit, but staff can't recommend because it does not meet code or it does not meet uh, the, the consistency for the area. I mean, so, it's a, it, so it becomes a recommendation issue versus it has to, it's a heavy fist to say you can't proceed further. What staff does is say we, don't, we would not recommend approval. You're welcome, to, you're welcome to submit. But most people don't recommend or don't submit if they aren't going to get staff's recommendation. And if it doesn't meet code, it, it doesn't meet code. It's kind of hard to you know, make a recommendation for something if, if it doesn't meet code in the first place. And Mr. Becker, regarding the what, loading, can you get? Up, sorry. Just and this is just informal conversations with people who looked at the property. Rear loading is just uh, makes it economically unfeasible for a townhome project. It's because of the cost of building another road, so it's just numbers. Yeah, I mean th that's first where. First of all, staff <laughs> wouldn't support it, and they want rear loading. So they go away. Well, and that's where you that's where you lose me on that that conversation because again, I'll, I'll respect the code in terms of the rear loading that we have in the code, and if it's not economically feasible, that's that's a, a you issue, not a, like a right right. But again, though, if you were to say, hey, I'm trying to do townhome product, and they're rear loaded per your code, and the only um, point of friction is the uh, compatibility issue. That's where I think that, okay, let's shepherd it through the process, or you should be shepherd, allow it to be shepherded through the process to get another set of eyes on it to make sure that everybody's aligned. But, well, you know, economics, I've never been one where it's, hey, if you're not making the type of profit that you need, that's really outside of my purview. That's, well, that comes down to developers. They look yep. at the, if you don't have staff, it's going to cost more money, we'll go into another site. Yep, yep. So. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, okay, yeah, um, just reading through the contract, the fact that we have a buffer to make sure there are no environmental issues, uh, that's the big issue. I don't want to surprise, and we've spent the people's money, and, and that's there. And it looks like that that's in order as long as we don't miss the cutoff date and lose the $100,000 deposit. But all that looks in order. The one question I had, uh, it's page 143 for us up here. Uh, no soil borings or other invasive tests shall be conducted on the property without seller's prior written consent. 
which consent may be withheld in seller's sole discretion. So I just want to make sure we can test it to the degree that mm -hmm. we need to. And I think that's semantics at this point, but just, I just want that yes. line clarified. The seller has agreed to a uh, extensive environmental study. First phase has been done. Uh, the second phase is underway. I don't have mm -hmm. a time frame for when it's going to be done, but they did some reconnaissance last week in mm -hmm. preparation for mm -hmm. coming in and I assume taking samples. And if I'm reading it correctly, that's something that he is obligated to present to us, but has no warranty on that. We still have to get our own testing, but we use that kind of to begin. Is that correct? So we still ourselves need to test. I just want to make sure we have access to do it. So, Right. It it's going to depend on what we get back on the their results of their tests and then whether we okay. want to then incur further tests as, as well in order to, right. to be, um, be certain. I, I kind of liken it to the birding park. You know, we've got a, a small arsenic what, a half an acre, an acre that obviously we're not doing anything with that. You know, was, we don't have a playground on top of it, so it's it's not a problem. But here, if we're you know we're going to be utilizing it, it would it need to be yeah. clean or you know they cap it, which is the other way. You know, mm -hmm. put if you've got a small area, let's say there was a, a chemical dump or a, a, a oil spill, you can cover it with right. cement. And right. There's 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 different things. I've negotiated <laughs> these in in the past. In the <clears throat> excuse me, in the past, it was actually a, a park that <clears throat> that um, was a land swap with the water management district, and the water management district neglected to tell us that there was a cattle dipping vat <laughs> right near where the playground was going to be built in this park. Um, after four years of negotiations with DEP, we actually did uh, were able to identify the plume, the arsenic plume. Um, the soil was removed; it was it was treated, and then the, what usually what the DEP will require is that you just have a restrictive covenant over the land that prohibits any type of um, groundwater wells, no wells, um, can't draw groundwater from there, mm -hmm. um, and then other types of restrictions. But those are those are matters that you would, if that were to be found. I mean, it does not make the park space completely unusable. At the this park is a um, it's a readily available park, um, just subject to certain restrictions for the use of the property, and mainly no wells to draw groundwater out of there. But if there was never your intended use, then that's what um, you're going to be dealing with with DEP. Well, that was the main thing for me. As long as we have that assurance that we can put the brakes on, if, if something like that comes up, then I'm okay to proceed in this process. And Great. Commissioner Smith, you I'm good. Okay, the, um, the only one thing I don't think was in the agreement, just, just one for the, the record for the Sumner family, is that they want to have kind of neat they've got in the back piece of the property is a, is a small um, not grove but as 25 or 30 palm trees that the Sunmers, which I'm sure was not legal back then because it's not legal today they brought seeds back from Israel mm. a, single seed. a single seed and so this single seed now is a 30 or so uh, palm palm trees there and they want to name it the Sumner some, which I think, Some you know, the history is kind of cool that it was 50 or so, 60 years ago that they, they made that trip to, mm -hmm. to Israel. So I think that's something I'd like to, you know, if we're going to, I want to honor that, that if we, we end up, you know, purchasing property, I want to honor that, that kind of handshake agreement with the Sumner family. So maybe that can work with our friendship agreement over there when I was able to go back in 2016. So yeah, be something so, special. Anyway. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing and look for a motion to <laughs> authorize the purchase of the Sumner property located at 27 North Binion Road. Well, uh, can we specify? This isn't the authorized to purchase. It's, this it's is not, authorized no, to negotiation. To negotiate. Negotiate. Right. Um, this is yeah. not a for, we're not making a formal offer. We're, we're basically looking at we've, right. we've got a, a purchase Price or requested price at this point, if they come back and say, no, we're not going to accept that, now we're in, in negotiations. So okay. it's author. So because your slide did say authorize the sale, but on the, the motion is really the request on the lead in packet, right? Authorize staff to negotiate purchase and yeah. sale agreement with owners yeah. of right. Sumner this, property. This, this would authorize staff to actually present the contract to the property owners on behalf of the city. Yeah. If that's if that's yep. a motion, then so move. Okay, we've got a yep. motion by Commissioner Becker. Right. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All mm -hmm. those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Eric. All right, next up, ordinance number 2914. Ordinance number 2914. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida, changing the zoning from T Transitional District to MUKPI Kelly Park Interchange District Mixed Use and assigning neighborhood and transition overlay districts for certain real property located south of Onditch Road and east of Round Lake Road, comprising 205.07 acres more or less and owned by Kelly Park Land Investments, LLC, Gavin, Galvin Land Services, LLC, and Harris KP, LLC, providing for directions to the Community Development Director, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Bill. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. Phil Martinez, Planner 2 with the City's Planning Division. The applicant is requesting a rezoning from Transitional District to Kelly Park Interchange District mixed use with a neighborhood overlay and a transition overlay along with a master plan. The subject properties are highlighted in yellow and comprise <laughs> of 205.07 acres. The surrounding area consists of residential and agricultural properties along with Onditch Road to the north and Round Lake Road to the west. The properties are zoned transitional district and in accordance with the Kelly Park Interchange form base code, the applicant is requesting the MU KPI zoning. The subject properties, also highlighted in yellow, have mixed use future land use, which is compatible with the proposed MU KPI zoning. The master plan to fix 670 single family lots with 52 foot wide front loaded lots being depicted in yellow and 40 foot wide rear loaded lots being depicted in orange. In addition, areas for 300 future <coughs> multifamily units are located at the, at the southern ends of the development. The future multifamily parcels will require a master plan amendment. Access to the site is proposed off of Onditch Road to the north and West Kelly Park Road to the south. The master plan also depicts 10 future access points throughout the development. They are located in the double arrow symbols. The applicant has provided 40.81 acres of open space where 39.83 acres are required. The open space includes two pools with restroom facilities and a trail network that is depicted in the orange, segment, or orange segmented line going from Kelly Park Road up to Onditch Road around the Central Park area, as long, along with western segments uh, going to the end of the development and a, an eastern segment going to the end of the development. The Development Review Committee and Planning Commission recommend approval of the proposed change of zoning and master plan. And the recommended motion for this afternoon is to accept the first reading of ordinance number 2914 and hold it over for second reading and adoption. This concludes my presentation, and the applicant has a presentation as well. Okay. Any questions for uh, Phil? Just, for just one for me. Uh, the line that goes out to Effie Drive on the right side, um, future land use map, is that an access line, or you see it right there, is that an access easement that's part of this, or was that just an error that, that was or, wrong? Yeah, so the yellow line that goes out to Effie Drive. That is part of the... Uh, this parcel. It's, it's so it does order. have an easement over to that. Uh, I mean, I mean an access point. I'm sorry. It's, this land area does go all the way out to Effie Drive within that narrow yellow segment. It is the same parcel as is this rectangular. Okay, it's just uh, real narrow. It, it's not an access drive yet. Okay, <laughs> but it allows for that in the future. If it's combined with other property, it's not. It's okay. not wide enough for an actual roadway yet. Okay. Any other questions for Phil? I have two. Sure. Uh, on, on, on the project summary where it says uh, five to ten dwelling units per acre, then in parentheses it says 15 with a density bonus. What does that mean? So in the Kelly Park form-based code, what the applicant can attain a density bonus, which would allow for a maximum of 15 dwelling units per acre in the transition overlay. And they did that by um, dedicating the tract P16, tract P16 to be privately owned and maintained but open to the public. 
And by doing that, one can attain a density bonus in the transition overlay. It's on that matter, I know, Michael, we're, and Jim, we're looking to, to get rid of that Correct. density yeah. bonus. I, I don't, that's. Uh, it, it, it's on the books right now. Um, the next set of glitch amendments, we are going to be recommending removing that part of the density bonus because if, if you have a consolidated development like this, it's kind of hard to say that it's open up to the general public because somebody from uh, this area is not going to go up there to utilize it. So it's, 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 it's more for their benefit than the, the general, general public. public. All right, so but they it's qualified the right for the distance. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. All right, All right. then my second question is, uh, on on it drive is that going to require road improvement i'm sorry did you say on this drive yes there are turn lanes proposed on on this road at the moment and as far as uh transportation improvements uh we'll <laughs> there are turn lanes proposed at the entrance and uh we will on is a county road and the county's looked at this but the reality is most of the traffic's going to the south. So I don't really see that as a problem right now. It's definitely something that's on our radar. But um, no, for right now, the turn lane should be sufficient. There's virtually no traffic on that road now. And, and if 95% of it or even 80% of the traffic goes to the south, it doesn't um, trip anything that requires roadway widenings. All right. Any other questions for Phil? Not the, Frank? No, I mean, I, and to your point, Pam, I mean, on in Orange County Road, um, but reality too, as if on on ditch, um, hopefully Orange County will put some lighting on that corner, that curve, because I remember the gentleman that used to come in here, and his name <laughs> is escaping me right now, but he lives right on that curve, and it gets pretty dangerous. Um, so the more traffic, the more opportunity for it to perpetuate. When this project first came in, I told them, mm -hmm. and not knowing them and not trusting them, <laughs> I called Orange County myself and told them, you need to look at this project. Mm -hmm. I can't force them to do anything, um, but I'll call them again. And, and they may have, um, have had discussions that I'm not aware of, but I understand what you're saying, and yeah. it's a valid point. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, come on forward. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name's Allison McGillis. I'm with Poulos and Bennett here on behalf of the property owners. So staff did a great job outlining this presentation, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly so you don't have to hear the same thing twice. Property size is about 205 acres. It's within the Kelly Park Interchange mixed use area. Future land use is mixed use. We're not requesting to change the future land use. We are requesting to change the zoning from transitional district to the mixed use Kelly Park interchange zoning. And then we're also requesting approval for our master plan. So in terms of a development program, we're proposing 670 multifamily units mixed up uh, 52 foot wide front load lots and 40 foot wide rear load lots. We have our main access point from Kelly Park Road to the south with a secondary access point from on ditch on the north, and then several cross access points to the east, west, and south of the, to the adjacent properties. Um, we are consistent with the Kelly Park form base code, and at the, la at the planning commission meeting, there was a request from a neighbor to provide a privacy fence on the western side, so we've agreed to do that, and I'm providing a six foot vinyl PVC fence along that boundary to buffer the adjacent properties. This project was really designed around our central amenity area with the letter F on it, the central open space and amenity. 
We do have uh, pool and clubhouse areas. Within that amenity, the letters A and B represent those pool and clubhouse areas. And then several parks throughout the development, pocket parks and neighborhood parks. And then we have uh, a trail system connecting Kelly Park Road through our development around our central amenity space to the north on Onditch, and then also two connection points to the east and west. And I know there was a lot of discussion about our transportation, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dan O'Keefe with Schutz and Bowen to, kind of, to explain our transportation improvements for the project. Thank you, Allison. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, Dan O'Keefe with Schutz and Bowen. Uh, here on behalf of the applicant, uh, and and I think what you've seen here has evolved a lot. There's been a, a lot of meetings with your staff and uh, stakeholders to to come up with the, the plan that we have here today. Uh, this is you know one of the first in the in the overlay, and we realize that there's a lot of projects coming in after after this one. So we've been working with. Uh, Pam Richmond and your staff on a development agreement that would address transportation issues, including the widening of Kelly Park Road, design, engineering, and construction, uh, traffic signals to be uh, constructed and linked uh, along Kelly Park Road, as well as coordinating the impacts on the ultimate uh, build-outs and improvements to Effie Road and Golden Gem Road and sort of the whole, the whole region. So, your staff's looking at this, not just with this one project that's coming in, but saying, wait a second, you guys are going to be part of this whole overlay and the vision that we have for this area. So let's make sure that on, on your transportation agreement that we're, we're doing the right design, we're accommodating for future development, we're pay, paying our proportionate share to, to fund those and actually get improvements started and constructed on the ground. So uh, with that, we, we'll, we will continue to work with your staff to finalize a development agreement to bring before you for your consideration, and it is our intention to have that development agreement uh, presented to you concurrent with the second reading of this uh, uh, requested action today, should you approve it today. So with that, uh, we have Mohammed from uh, Traffic Mobility Consultants, our traffic consultant. Uh, we have uh, Allison and, and Lance Bennett from Polis and Bennett, our, our engineers and planners, and we're available to answer any questions that uh, the commission may have. Uh, the, the only last question I have, and maybe not for you all, maybe it's back to staff because um, it's always in the forefront around school capacity and things like that. So the letter that was received on February is basically saying the puts and takes of the breakout of the original Rochelle breakout of what the, the um, density and housing product type, even with those shifts, all of those reservations are not impacted by this rezoning uh, step meaning the capacity is there based off the previous future land use. Is that correct? Am I interpreting that letter correctly? Correct, Mr. Commissioner Becker. Uh, OCPS basically said it's vested on the existing CEA that is out on the Rochelle Holdings property. Okay. So capacity is taken care of. Mr. will be the right title here. So <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but thank you. Okay. Any, any other questions for the applicant? No, that was my, my question because yeah, yeah. the letter says does not does not exceed 478 students generated. So, Bobby, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question, sir. Oh, I was saying the letter that I see from the school board says that this does not exceed the 478 students generated. Yeah, it's based off of the formulas that uh, OCPS has on their um, their capacity reservation breakdowns. So. They had looked it over and said that it basically there's an existing CEA on the property, that capacity is good for the rezoning standpoint. However, this has to go through concurrency. Uh, when development plans come in, they'll have to have concurrency taken care of, which is Florida law, prior to a plat being approved on the project. All right. Good. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? With this uh, zoning change proposal, I'm looking at what appears on the agenda, and that includes master plan. Forgive me for not being clear about, is it just a zoning change, or does this include the uh, residential development as well? 
what, what's what's being proposed here? <laughs> it's the first, is, is first it reading for the change, or is it more than that? Yes, it's a first reading for zoning change and, and approval of the master plan itself. So next, the next uh, meeting that this comes before City Council, once we get the development agreement, they'll they'll be coming at the same time. It'll be basically the uh, zoning approval and the development agreement at the same time. Okay. Okay. So the next time this is considered is at the second reading. For the zoning, yes. The master plan is being approved tonight, though. We have okay. to have two readings for an does, ordinance. Does the master, master plan, plan does, consideration also take into account the, the residential development? That's my question. Yes. That's on the table right now? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So my question is this. My issue is this. I thought that it was agreed some time ago by you, Mr. Mayor, that in the future, for the agendas that the public has access to, that if there's a development plan with the acreage, there would be an indication of how many units. Am I right? I thought that that was going to be standard practice that was agreed upon. Oh, we're going back, I think, probably a couple of years. It's see, I don't see that summary. here. It's in the project uh, summary. Is yeah. that what you're speaking of? Yeah. It, it's in there. Oh, you want it on the... On the um, he wanted it on the agenda. Yeah, the agenda, not, yeah. In, the, not point, in the The point I'm trying to make is I, I don't see that correct. on the agenda, and I thought that some time yeah. ago it was agreed that that would that, be there. That is that Because is from the public, the layperson's standpoint, that's important. Sure. Uh, it all has to do with density and uh, the trend line. Yes, yes. I think that's fair enough. Do you? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Okay. I agree. <laughs> we got a second reading for that, but we'll definitely need to put that on the second yep. reading, the number of units. All right, Mr. Olson. Yes, sir. <clears throat> School board. Mayor, Commissioners, Rod Olson, 3156 Rolling Hills Lane. In Apopka, uh, my concern is the aspect of trading, as I understand, allowing additional density, which our current plan allows for, to build that. Nobody is going to go to this in the middle of an apartment I, complex. I, I and agree. This needs to be addressed. It, Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, we it was already. Yep, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Jim, how how long before we'll have the next set of glitch amendments? Um, planning Commission is actually next week. City Council is May 6th and May 20th, I believe okay. it is. So we'll, this will definitely be on that. For the, for the I'm, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> talking to Phil. For the, the, the bonus density? Yes, yeah, that'll okay, be, that'll be on, on there. there. Okay, yep. Okay. All I'm right. sorry. <laughs> okay, anybody else from the public wish to speak on this matter? All right, bring it back to Council. Uh, look for a motion. To approve ordinance number 2914 at first reading and holdover for a second reading and adoption. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2918. Ordinance number 2918. An ordinance of the city of Apopka, Florida to extend its territorial and municipal limits to annex pursuant to Florida Statute 171.044, the hereinafter described lands situated and being in Orange County, Florida. Owned by Wanda Sue McClarty, located west of Plymouth Sorrento Road, south of Haas Road, and east of State Road 429, providing for directions to the city clerk, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Jean? Good afternoon, Jean Sanchez with the Community Development Department. This is a request to accept ordinance number 2918, the annexation of 5708 Plymouth Sorrento Road. Parcel is located west of Plymouth Sorrento Road, east of State Road 429 and south of Ondich Road, approximately 10 acres in size. The parcel abuts properties in the city jurisdiction on its western and southern boundaries. The recommended motion to, is to accept ordinance number 2918 and hold it over for second reading and adoption on May 4th, 2020, 
2022. Staff and applicant are available for questions. Any, any questions for Gene on this? Okay, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? I'm, I'm gonna close the public hearing, but I just want, uh, I know Jean has been working on our tree ordinance, our street tree ordinance, you know, and so she's, you know, reached out to the University of Florida. I mean, I, some other, you know, kind of experts in that field right. of, of street trees that obviously won't pop our sidewalks like oaks are, are doing. So hopefully we'll have that in the next. It'll that's in the next glitch, in the amendment. glitch amendment. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yep. no, that's awesome. Yeah, so anyway, but but a great point, Commissioner Becker, that, yeah, we need to, the, the street trees we have in Piedmont Lakes are, have been a disaster. So we need to. Also, what I wanted to address, and I, I think yesterday I did bring this up, regarding the fee schedules of the trees that are taken down by the developers. Um, I understand that the last time we even had uh, that schedule even uh, considered was back in 1992. Um, and we're not in line with the neighboring cities. And, um, you know, one of the things that I constantly hear is that we are the city of trees, and yet when these developments come in, they kind of flatten uh, the parcels that they, they buy, and then there's a mitigation for the trees they take down, but the fees that they pay uh, for the trees they take down is not in line with other cities. I mean, we're, we're, we're literally not charging enough for them taking those trees down. Um, and so um, I understand that the last time we even <coughs> did anything was in 1992. So how can we direct the staff so that, you know, we're allowing them to take down so many trees, and that's something that I constantly hear from, you know, just the residents in our community is that we are the city of trees and we're allowing these developers to come in and just kind of level all these trees that we have. And a lot of them are really good trees. Understood. So, if we, I understand that Jim is actually. Yeah, if we, we could, if we could discuss this at the, you know, the uh, uh, comment section versus, versus the annexation, and then that way we want, you know, we can get a motion or something like that. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make yeah, yeah. that, yeah, because yeah, <laughs> only because she mentioned that she's trying to yep. change uh, the the Three ordinances trees. that we have about w what trees we plant, yep. okay. um, and you know that is a concern. The oak trees, and you're right, Mayor. We are having a lot of discussions mm -hmm. from residents in Piedmont mm -hmm. Lakes over trees, you know, kind of destroying the sidewalks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to close this public hearing. Look for a motion to approve ordinance number 2918 at first reading and hold over for a second reading and adoption. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? All right. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2919. Ordinance number 2919. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida to extend its territorial and municipal limits to annex pursuant to Florida Statute 171.044 the here and after described land situated at being in Orange County, Florida, owned by David E. Beckel, located west of Plymouth Sorrento Road, south of Haas Road, and east of State Road 429, providing for directions <laughs> to the city clerk, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Jean? For the record, Jean Sanchez with the Community Development Department. This is a request to accept ordinance number 2919, the annexation of 5706 Plymouth Sorrento Road, Parcel is located east of State Road 429 and north adjacent of the Bridal Path subdivision, approximately 5.4 acres in size. Parcel abuts properties in the city jurisdiction and its southern and western boundaries. The recommended motion is to accept ordinance number 2919 and hold it over for second reading and adoption on May 4th, 2022. Staff and applicant are available for questions. Okay, any questions from Jean? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve ordinance number 2919 at first reading and hold over for a second reading and adoption. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. <clears throat> ordinance number 2920. Ordinance number 2920. An ordinance of the city of Apopka, Florida mm. to extend its territorial and municipal limits to annex pursuant to Florida Statute 171.044, the here and after described land situated and being in Orange County, Florida. Owned by David, e. David L. Backel, located west of Plymouth Sorrento Road, 
south of Haas Road and east of State Road 429, providing for directions to the city clerk, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. This is a request to accept ordinance number 2920, 20, the annexation of 5704 Plymouth Sorrento Road. The property, the property is located at 5704 Plymouth Sorrento, Plymouth Sorrento Road, west of, of that road and north adjacent of the bridle path subdivision, approximately, approximately 1.8 acres. The recommended motion is to accept ordinance, ordinance number 2920 and hold it over for second reading and adoption on May 4th. 2022 staff and applicant are available for questions. Any questions for Jean? Anybody from the public wishes? Anybody from the public wishes to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve ordinance number 2920 at first reading and hold over for a second reading and adoption. Okay. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. Second. Second by Commissioner Bankson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Next up, 2924. Ordinance number 2924, an ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida, granting the petition of GMB Development Services, LLC, establishing and naming the Kelly Park Community Development District pursuant to Chapter 190 Florida Statutes, describing the external boundaries, the functions, and powers of the district, designating five persons to serve as the initial members of the District Board of Supervisors, providing a severability clause and an effective date. Michael. Good afternoon. The um, item for you is the ordinance to establish the Kelly Park Community Development District. This is similar to the last Community Development District, which we all we commonly known as CBDs, that was presented to you previously. I believe it was for the Ridge. This would create a governing body, um, which will handle a lot of the operations and finances for the development. The advantages of a CDD, it's a statutory mechanism uh, these bodies, as statutory bodies, governing bodies, are actually subject to sunshine. They are also authorized by statute to issue bonds to help pay for their infrastructure improvements. So this is the, um, the purpose of this um, ordinance, is to allow for the establishment and creation of the CDD for the um, Kelly Park community. Um, it's, it's not, there isn't anything novel or... Um, out of the ordinary with this, the, uh, the mechanism the, uh, and the uh, substantive aspects of the ordinance are similar to the last ones in regards to the ridge. So this is the first reading we ask that we recommend that we move this forward to second reading for adoption of the ordinance establishing the CDD for the Kelly Park community. Any questions for Michael? Anybody from the public wishes to speak on this matter? Not will close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve ordinance number 2924 at first reading and hold over for a second reading and adoption. So move. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next up, resolution 2022 05. Resolution 2022 05. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, setting forth the city's intent to extend the territorial territorial limits of Oaks at Kelly Park Municipal Services Benefit Unit to include phases three, phase three, and to use the uniform ad valorem method of collection of a non-ad valorem assessment for properties lying within the Oaks at Kelly Park Street Lighting District in the city of Apopka to fund street lighting services, facilities, programs, providing that a couple copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to the property appraiser, tax collector, and the Florida Department of Revenue in accordance with section 197.3632 paren 3 paren a Florida statutes, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Mayor Townsend, Chuck Beaver, City Administration. Um, what you have before you is extending a current MSBU that the city established previously. Um, they are doing an additional phase four, and at this time we're requesting council approval to extend that particular MSBU. Any questions for Chuck? Anybody from public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-05. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2022-06. Resolution 2022-06, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, setting forth the City's intent to extend the territorial limits 
of Winding Meadows Municipal Services Benefits Unit to include, include phase three and to use the uniform, not, uniform ad valorem method of collection of a non ad valorem assessment for properties lying within the Oaks at Kelly Park Street Lighting District in the city of Apopka to fund street lighting services, facilities, and programs, providing that a copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to the property appraiser, tax collector, and the Florida Department of Revenue in accordance with section 197.3632, paren 3, paren A, Florida statutes, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and an effective date. Chuck. Mayor, uh, uh, Council, Chuck Vavrick, City Administration. Um, for the record, this is extending the Winding Oaks, or excuse me, uh, Winding Meadows. And I do see that I made a clerical error in the title, and I will make that scrivener error correct. But you're extending the boundary of that particular MSB to include phase three. Any questions for Chuck? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve or adopt resolution 2022 06. So moved. moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez, second by Commissioner Bankson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, Resolution 2022-07. Resolution 2022-07. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, setting forth the City's intent to use the uniform ad valorem method of collection of a non-ad valorem assessment for properties lying within the Ivy Trail Street Lighting District in the City of Apopka to fund street lighting services, facilities, and programs, providing that a copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to the property appraiser, tax collector, and the Florida Department of Revenue in accordance with section 197.3632, paren 3, paren A, Florida statutes, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Mayor, Council, Chuck Maverick, City Administration, this is creating a, a street lighting district for a new development called <coughs> Ivy Trail, um, <coughs> staff request your approval to create the MS MSBU for the funding of street lighting. Any questions for Chuck? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-07. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second, Second by Commissioner Bankson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2022-09. Resolution 2022-09, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, setting forth the City's intent to use the uniform ad valorem method of collection of a non-ad valorem assessment <coughs> properties lying within the Magnolia Terrace Street Lighting District in the City of Apopka to fund street lighting services, facilities, and programs, providing that a copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to the property appraiser tax collector and the Florida Department of Revenue in accordance with section 197.3632, parent 3, parent A, Florida statutes, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and for an effective date. Mayor said Council, Chuck Havoc, City Administration, this is for the creation of street lighting district for the funding of street lighting in the Magnolia Terrace area. Any questions for Chuck? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-09. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2022-10. Resolution 2022-10. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, setting forth the City's intent to use the uniform ad valorem method of collection of a non ad valorem assessment for properties lying within the Willow Run Street Lighting District in the city of Apopka to fund street lighting, pro street lighting services, facilities, and programs, providing that a copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to the property appraiser, tax collector, and the Florida Department of Revenue in accordance with section 197.3632, paren 3, paren A, Florida statutes, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and for an effective date. Mayor, City Council, Chuck Maverick, City Administration. This is a request to create the Willow Run Street Lighting Municipal Services Benefit Unit for the purposes of paying the street lighting bill. Any questions for Chuck? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-10. <coughs> so moved. So uh, got a motion by Commissioner Becker. 
Second. Second by Commissioner Bankson. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I know, Chuck, once you, while we finished up on there, talk about we're going to try to wrap all these up. We're looking at. Yeah, we're, we're, we're actually, and I, I had mentioned to the council members previously, we're actually looking at creating here in the near future um, a citywide street lighting district, and we'll, we'll fold everything into one district, and we won't have all these separate ones. But uh, we have to do a study, so I'm working on getting the final cost to do the study, and then we'll come back to you to create a, a, an overlay for the whole city. And we won't have to create all these entries. Okay. All right. All right. Next up, resolution 2022-14. Good afternoon. The item before you is Resolution 2022-14, which um, basically proclaims April 10th as Florida Gopher Tortoise Day in the city of Apopka. Uh, the, the resolution is modeled after similar resolutions and proclamations that have been declared throughout the state of Florida, where, um, wherein April 10th has been designated as Gopher Tortoise Day. This time, staff recommends approval of the resolution declaring April 10th Gopher Tortoise Day in the city of Apopka. Any questions for Michael? The only addition from the ones that we had received from the resident right. last was that collaboration with the public and private entities. What was the right. insertion? Was, of, um, what was the driver there? I right. got that from other jurisdictions. It's just, again, th this is a ceremonial resolution. Mm -hmm. So these are really um, more aspirational goals in which when you have other corporation within the other entities in order to bring forth awareness um, this resolution does not have the effect of law, does not have any regulatory or administrative authority over the city, but is merely a ceremonial proclamation declaring a day for Gopher Tortoise Day and bringing awareness. And, and the heavier weight on that, that whereas statement is vital for the conservation and long-term survival. So that's the spirit of that particular line, right? Um, declaring this April 10th, does this assume an annual or is this for 2022 only? It's ceremonial. I mean, it could be it could be declared, and it's that 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 day will be known here forth as okay. as go for Tortoise Day. Okay. Any other questions for Michael? Okay. Invite from the public. Which one to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion <laughs> to yeah, adopt. Think, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm moving slow. Okay. Uh, Michelle Chase, Rock Springs Ridge HOA. So as far. I guess I'm going along with what Becker was asking because this has been brought forward to you by some of our residents, of course, because you know that we're going to be selling that parcel that has an easement on it. So I ask when that petition or that application comes up here, what bearing is that going to have on that? Well, we have no, we have no bearing with that conservation easement. So it, the city has no interest in that. Okay, that's what I was asking if mm -hmm. the proclamation you know, of Tortoise Day is going to have any bearing on, it is our parcel and it is our easement or the developers to remove. So just wanted to make sure that one doesn't affect the other. Well, I think the purpose of, you know, a resolution or things like that, the spirit of a conservation easement in the writing in its current form is a state of perpetuity. And I would think that when the state agency that is looking at re removing that or doing anything differently with it, if they look at their local municipalities and they see value right. in their preservation and protection decision. of that species, that, that would bear some sort of weight in that decision-making process. Right. Michael, you want to okay. kind of weigh in on that one? Local governments do not regulate in terms of these environmental regulations. It's going to be deferred to the state, and, and especially the way that the legislature conducts itself. Any type of overreaching on the part of the local government, we can expect a pretty hefty slap from the, from the legislature if we are to overreach um, into those areas. And again, this is a ceremonial proclamation. This would be like you know, proclaiming, I don't know why the first name that came to my mind was Willie Mays Day. <laughs> <laughs> again, I don't, I mean, opening day is coming, so that's why it was in, your baseball in my head. So um, this does not have the effect of law. This does not affect um, any type of potential 
or hypothetical application to amend a, um, any type of conservation agreement anywhere. This is, we're hereby declaring it go for toward his day, April 10th, and that's the, the effect. This well, is the, let me chime in real quick. I mean, I'm not gonna sit up here and waste time passing a resolution that I think is just ceremonial, it doesn't mean anything. I just, I'm, I'm going to approve a resolution because I think that there's value in protecting a species called the gopher tortoise. And I think, and, and, and that's why I made the, the comment that I did, I fully am aware that the city has no bearing in the decision of whether or not that conservation easement exists for perpetuity like, as it's stated, or it comes away and is done anything differently. That's not the purview of this board, <clears throat> but I will say that there's value there in having it there. Um, and that's my opinion. That's why I would support passing a resolution like this. Understood. Yeah. Good afternoon again. I don't know if you remember. So name address. Right oh, my name again. Okay, Sue Moyer, five three zero Sand Wedge Loop. I live in Rock Springs Ridge, and I brought this resolution proposal to the city council two weeks ago. So I am happy to hear that you are considering it for a resolution. I just also wanted to say that gopher tortoises have been protected in the state of Florida since 1975. So this is not something that's merely just a ceremonial thing. And students are taught this in school. Um, when our development was put forth um, in the late 90s, in April 2002, they had to set aside this area this 51 acres, the gopher tortoise area all across our neighborhood to be able to build there because there is value in protecting the species because they are a keystone species and 350 species require the burrows that the gopher tortoises make for their survival. There's a whole um, ecological system that go around the gopher tortoises. So that's more than just something ceremonial, it's actually living out and protecting our nature and not just doing something that doesn't mean anything. And I agree with um, Commissioner Becker that this is really important, that we realize that it is important. We need to start protecting our species and not just building over them or um, doing the pay for play that a lot of developments seem to get away with and then just pay, pave over the gopher tortoises and have them suffocate underground so that we can put in more building. Thank you. Thank you. So anybody else from the public? Rod Olson. Mayor, Commissioners, Rod Olson, 3156 Rolling Hills Lane. My number two granddaughter has six turtles that I build a pen for in the backyard, one of which is a gopher tortoise. <laughs> we should support this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, gosh. Okay. Michelle Chase, Rock Springs Ridge. I, I think that's great. And if you're going to do that, I would ask that the city find all the turtles in Apopka and notate where they, they are. We shouldn't just point out the ones that are on the 51 acres. There are also 68 on the 319 acres of land that we're trying to purchase, and they're all over Apopka. So if you're going to have the day, I think you should recognize and place that on all homeowner parcels. This isn't limited to the 51 acres. This is a citywide resolution. Okay. Anybody else? We'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-14. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2022-15. Resolution 2022-15. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, adopting the language access plan for limited English proficiency persons for the Community Development Block Grant, COVID, CDBG-CV program, and other federally funded grant programs. Mayor and Council, the CDBG grant requires name, that the name, city name, adopt a... Give us your name. I'm sorry, Dr. Jackson. <laughs> the uh, CDBG grant program requires that the city adopt a resolution that states that we will make sure that all of our documentation and advertisements are translated. So this is just a resolution abiding by that grant. 
Okay, any questions for Dr. Jackson? Um, well, here is another resolution, um, which is asking that we have the uh, any documents translated in Spanish. Um, when will that start? So this is for all advertisements and all documentation related to the CDBG grants and all of our other grants. So whenever we've made any advertisements, um, advertising regarding the grant, we have made sure that it was also in Spanish. Okay. And so when we start the whole application process, for instance, even with the housing project, this will apply. We'll make sure that we have it also translated. And Michael, you can pretty well handle that. I'm trying to think, I think I have, I have translated a couple of these applications or some of the language. So uh, I am equipped to do it. I so if, if if we cannot find somebody in a pinch, I, right. I can do the and translations. And we also have staff, other staff that have agreed to translate if you right. uh, Further, I mean, any legal document or it's going to be translated, I will still review it for legal proficiency and that we have the proper legal, um, proper legal language um, in the document. And by legal language, I actually mean legal Spanish language mm -hmm. in the document. I mean, there is a, there is a, there is a difference. I mean, practically speaking, just like there's English and legalese, believe it or not, there is Spanish legalese as well. And I learned that the hard way. I was the one who, who wrote all the ballot questions in Volusia County in Spanish. Um, so and I had to make sure that I met the legal requirements in Spanish. The legalities don't, don't disappear because the language changes. So, um, any, legal documents will still be run through the city attorney's office for review, both in English and Spanish. Okay. All right. Any, any questions? Any other questions? Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing and look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-15. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2022-16. <clears throat> resolution 2022-16, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2021, and ending September 30th, 2022, providing for a budget amendment. Vladimir Ortega, Finance Director for the City of Apopka. Resolution 2022-16, City Council agenda, uh, agenda item reference in today's meeting regarding the emergency designation and ratification for the fire department's purchase of a 2022 Ford F-250 squad vehicle. This purchase is to replace the 2013 F-250 squad vehicle that is currently inoperable due to the engine failure. The total amount requested on the resolution 2022-16 is 48,850 plus a 10% contingency. Any questions for Gladimir? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing and look for a motion to adopt resolution 2022-16. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, City Council reports. Commissioner Velasquez. Oh. Well, I saw that you are going to speak on the Apopka serves, and of course that um, I participated in that. Uh, along with my Kiwanis group and, of course, with the city. So I, I did enjoy um, participating in the two projects that we had. Uh, I had more fun at the Christian Highland Academy <laughs> with the building, of course, my passion, building a park. Although I didn't participate in the actual building, but to be there was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Yeah, Johnson. that was fun. We actually got to work on the railroad tracks right at Central and found some interesting things in the field there, but uh, <laughs> it was just great to see the community coming out yeah. together and, and yeah. really, you know, bringing up the curb value. Yes. Um, I had one thing that I wanted to bring up. I'm sure others, I'm assuming, have gotten the question about this. Let me uh, go back. Uh, this is uh, from Karen Settle, and it's concerning the Piedmont Park Homeowners Association. Oh, I did have that, yeah. And... Uh, it just, it appears there, and she sent a letter that Jeff Weatherford, when he worked with us mm -hmm. at the time, had given, uh, I, I won't say assurances, but basically had said that the city will do A or B. Obviously, that never came before us that I recall, so that's why I wanted to bring it up here. And if so, what do we do to address it? And 
I was told to talk with you, so I didn't know if we discuss it further here or I do yeah, that behind I know the that, scenes. That but here Leo you are. And, and Paul ha were out at the site. And I mean, you got maybe some some. Right. Um, we went out to the site. Name, name and address. Two days. Yes. My name is David Budo. I'm the public service director. Um, we went out to the site. We did an evaluation of the medium um, and also the road work. The next process that we are trying to do is to come up with a cost estimate. And we will reach back with the homeowner um, resident and talk to them about the proposal. And if I know Karen, she's probably watching right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah we I told her they would be back with her by the middle of next week. So Ooh, we've okay. got a yeah. So, right, so there is a process trying right, to work I'm trying foods. to get a proposal out, a cost estimate, and to determine how much it would cost. I'll have to come back and, and discuss with the with the mayor about the fundings, and then I will discuss with the homeowner. And the question is, do we fix the problem? Or do we fix the problem and resurface? I mean, if the road's right. kind right. of marginal, the question is, do we do it all at one, which would make it nice and seamless, mm -hmm. maybe jump starting a few other roads that maybe are in worse shape, but makes some logical sense to do it all at one time. So I think that's the, yeah. the challenge for the public services department. Right. And so, I thought it was important because she did receive a letter from a city staff employee at the time. Yeah. So... You know, I want to just make sure we follow through on that. Yep. Pictures there do show, yeah, obviously there's need. So we'll let the process go forward. And Right. I um, I'm working on a proposal. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Smith. Uh, a couple of items. Um, I, I wasn't able to participate in the city serve this past weekend, but I understand it was an outstanding project and very well uh, received and appreciated by the community. Uh, but as a result of that, uh, I did have one uh, concern was uh, there was one to know the possibility of having speed bumps placed on Hawthorne uh, near Alonzo Williams Park. Uh, there are evidence of individuals speeding on four-wheelers and motorcycles there, especially on the weekends and with kids playing in that area, it was a real concern. And uh, so there was some concern about the possibility of placing uh, speed bumps uh, on that street on Hawthorne near Alonzo Williams Park. And I know we have a speed bump program. Now, on Hawthorne, we heard it was on 7th, not on Hawthorne. He wants them on Mr. Rutland? Yes. Yes, I had a very lovely conversation with him a couple <laughs> days ago. And, and, and I agree with him. And yeah. we even laid out where we can. I want yeah. to put two speed humps there. Okay. And but, we're also doing them up. But wait a minute. We're... You were saying Hawthorne. He was saying seven. So which? He wants him on right there in front of his house, across the street from the Alonzo Williams, Williams Center building. Building. So right, but, but they need to be both between Hawthorne and. No, 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 no. He's oh. saying Hawthorne itself. We can't put him on Hawthorne. The posted speed's too high. Posted speed is too high. It's thirty-five. But we can put him on seven. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. And, 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 and we're going to do that. I'm, I have talked to uh, my partner at PD, Sergeant Harmon, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be coming the first meeting of May to tell you about the ones that we want to do to make sure that you're okay. with. There are three places we want to do them, the, the ones there and maybe the next block, and then the north-south road. Um, Marvin C. Zanders. We're going to put okay. one on each block from um, from Michael Gladden north because um, there's a problem there, too. All and right. so what I wanted to come with Sergeant Harmon and tell you how much money we're going to spend and what we're going to spend it on. All yes, right. sir, that's on the top of my list, and I'm still chomping at the bit to do some scripts. <laughs> All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next let, one. Let me, let me, while I'm, we're on streets, <clears> I wanted <throat> to say I know we still have $50,000 in the, in the budget for I call it the Brick Street facelift or uplift, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we still haven't spent that. So we're getting toward the end. You know, we're halfway through the, the budget year. So we want to make sure, you know, where we got the, not potholes, but where you've got the real um, indentations on Central especially. And there's also some of the cross streets where it's the, the Brick yes. streets. We've got $50,000. So what we're going to try to do is every year we'll spend 50000 
lifting up the worst of the, the potholes, or not really potholes, but the sunken areas. Yeah, yeah, leveling them out. So that's, I need to make sure Dio and Paul, we, we don't, you know, it's we're six months in and, you know, so it's only $50,000, but we figured every, we spend 50 every year we'll get the worst of the worst and, and start to upgrade those those brick streets. And we are we going to be able to address that alley that's off of off the 8th Street that, uh, oh, that comes out to Michael Marvin We need to get Marvin Zanders. I will, Yeah, we've got Dio's putting on his list there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, and in doing public comment, it was mentioned in reference to assistance to, to Ukraine. And I don't know if legally, if the city can do something uh, to assist. I, I tell you, you know, my wife has been collecting. We collected some clothing and whatnot, and take it to the Ukrainian church, you know, which is right there on mm -hmm. on uh, Lake McCoy Drive. And so I, I think that would be, I think, the best, you know, avenue to get things to to you know those people in the Ukraine that need our help. I think there are certain things they don't want. I so I need to probably get. Let me. Get, get a list. I'll get a list from her, you know, as to what they're really looking for. Matter of fact, I, you know, until this thing has been resolved, I'm wearing my Ukrainian watch just in, you know, memory of the folks that um, that are serving there. And, and so, could we put that list on the city website? <clears throat> absolutely. And ask yep. our residents to yep. support. Absolutely. This yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, and then, then lastly, uh, I've been appointed to serve on the uh, school superintendent search committee. Uh, oh, wow. There's 15 awesome. of us uh, that are serving on the school superintendent. Uh, Dr. Jenkins is retiring in December, uh, so we are starting a search for the, her replacement. Uh, we've had one meeting already as a committee. Uh, we've had seven meetings, uh, one in each one of the districts. We met at a Park High School on last Thursday, and we was at Lake Nona on last night. Uh, there is a survey on the school board website where they're asking residents to go and take their survey, and that survey will close at on 4.30 on Friday. So if you would go and do the survey between now and, and Friday and let us know what it is you would like to see in our next superintendent, what qualifications they should have, um, <clears throat> what obstacles that they need to confront, and what things that we have currently in place that we want to keep. So if you would go ahead and take that survey, and uh, it will close on Friday, then they will take all those comments and then all the comments from the seven meetings that have taken place and they will come back to the advisory committee. Then we will sit down and look at those things and then we will present to the school board the qualifications that we think we want to see in our next superintendent. And then that will be advertised uh, oh. for the job in May. Oh, so good. if you would do that, it would be appreciated. If you have anything you want to share uh, before I go back uh, to committee meeting, my next committee meeting is on the... Uh, 14th. Uh, so if you have any concerns, you can email, write those, or call me, and, and so I can have those to share as well. Thank oh, you. okay. So then I can I can give you some of the concerns that have been shared with me already. Yes. I please. don't because the survey. I mean, it doesn't allow to kind of. Um, it would be if I did the survey it would be from my point of view, but I have received some um, concerns about the without OCPS from other residents and actually uh, from other organizations. Can I give that yes, to you? Yes, please. Okay. Cool. All right. Commissioner Becker. Yeah. <clears throat> so while we were on the topic of glitch amendments before, um, and again, I'll thank staff. Uh, Jim helped out on this particular issue, but I don't want to have looming things uh, as I transition out. So a neighbor of mine uh, was trying to do a screen enclosure on the back of their property, and it had an aluminum roof. Um, and there's other examples citywide. I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of people that have aluminum roofs within the city. But within our land development code, any rear features do not allow for that aluminum roofing. Um, the reason provided by staff was more on the, on the side of what it could turn into long term. Um, you know, if someone tried to enclose it versus just truly having it as a screen porch, that was a concern. Or footers may not be substantial enough to support the roof and, and this, that, and the other. I would, I would encourage staff, as we're looking at the glitch amendments, to uh, bring forth the council <clears throat> an opportunity for that to be uh, to happen. Because unless there's a safety concern or aesthetic concern that I'm not aware of, <clears throat> if we can build into the code uh, the parameters around footers that are necessary or all those other requirements that would 
do it in a safe manner, I would just encourage staff to bring that forth to council during the glitch amendments. Uh, Commissioner Becker, there are some HOAs that do allow, allow aluminum our, roofs. Yeah, well. our, ours do. Okay, like there was no, done. yeah, there was no opposition from our HOA or surrounding neighbors. Um, and that's, so I just wanted to have an opportunity for if people, because some of those products, it's, it's a nice product. Um, and, it, and I don't think that people are doing it with ill intent to say, oh, in the future, I'm going to turn this into a real room. Um, you know, I just want to afford that opportunity. Yeah, so yeah, we'd get with Scott. And <laughs> that would be something that, uh, that we could look into. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of the rear setbacks are 20 feet or 25 feet. If they, if they went 10 feet into a required rear yard setback with a solid roof, as long as it's not, you know, across the whole back of the, uh, the you know, maybe 50% of the, uh, of the width of the house. Think, I'm thinking along lines of, of what this um, customer had. Yeah, and I'm trying to think of, you know, what's, what's you know, like my, my own personal situation, right? When I built my pool in the back of my property, and my, my screen enclosure goes all the way up until that seven and a half foot uh, easement, um, uh, utility easement. This particular product was a seven foot beyond the extension of the built-in lanai to the home. And it, aesthetically, it doesn't look like it's intruding into the yard much at all. When you walk the property, measure it out, it looks in line with all the other ones that exist in our neighborhood and, and the mm -hmm. other ones that I've seen. So that's why I was, you know, unless there was some sort of safety or um, that sort of hazard, I just I, I want to be able to uh, provide an opportunity for people to put those nice things on the back of their home. Because again, a lot of people might do things where they want the, the coverage from rain, but still enjoy the benefits of being in a screened, screened room. Right, where you can um, actually get some wind circulation out there. Oh yeah, in this, in this heat, absolutely. I, I've been thinking about that since, uh, since we did the email exchange, so. So I'm gonna stay committed to my neighbor and I'm gonna bring this to a, a point where I can't take it any further, um, just so that I can look him in the eye um, every day as I pass by him. Um, the other looming thing from last meeting I had asked, um, in terms of my service on Lake Apopka Natural Gas District, not sure when the, I'm happy to serve uh, in the April meeting. They typically occur on the fourth Mondays of every month, uh, but I would like to give noti notification to them what our, what our go forward is. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, if, if you all want, plan to appoint my replacement in the next meeting or the meeting after, um, I'll just need so, to. So when is the, when's the next? the next? The next board meeting would be April 25th, so the day before swearing in. Okay. Um, I'll, happy to serve in you that capacity. And then I'll let them know during that meeting, hey, there, there will be an appointment for the, for the well, next regularly we, scheduled. If we want to, I'd just probably just, when we do it at the next council meeting versus we have to wait. I mean, what you can make think, the, the appointment if you, as <laughs> long as you, well, the next council meeting is the 20th. You haven't given, you haven't actually formally. I haven't told them one way or the other. Right, right. so I don't, I don't want to jump ahead and actually Point someone to a board where that board member hasn't still, actually still, formally okay. Okay, so resigned yet. Get through the 25th, yeah. so and then, then I'll can, let you know officially, and then you can right, do it the next council right. meeting after that. Okay. At that point, yeah, I think it's it's better that way. Okay, awesome. Okay, all right. Um, under the city administrator's report, I just I guess what I'll do is just going to give you a kind of a. I hope he's not mad at me, but uh, this is for Edwards. You know, for for everybody to to understand where Edward's at. So anyway, he had his surgery uh, last Tuesday. Um, surgery went well. Uh, it was, I want to say 14 wow. hours. Started at 7 a.m. and was, I guess, in the recovery room at nine something. So a, a really, Matt, you know, a pr pretty extensive surgery. Um, he is, he's uh, still on a respirator, although a, a less intrusive respirator. Right. He's, he's on a feeding tube. Um, Making progress, he, from what I gather, walked two miles yesterday around the, the hospital floor. So he's doing well. Um, hopefully he's thinking maybe tomorrow or the next day he would get out. I think, he, I think he'd rather wait until the trach is completely removed before coming home because that's, that's a whole other set of challenges. So I think that's kind of his, um, his, uh, his thought. Uh, he still doesn't really want visitors. Um, you know, if you want to send him a note, or something that would be great um, and then I'll let everybody know including all the city employees when he's home that hey he's home and you know we'll kind of kind of play it by ear at that point so but um, his prayer you know prayers for him would be much appreciated um, 
and uh, he can't, he's itching to get home and itching to get back to work and, and, um, but uh, just keep him in your prayers. Michael, anything? No report. Okay. Um, under mayor's report, uh, Kate, why don't you come forward just, just real quick. I just want to, man, what a, tell you what, she, she takes on some pretty big challenges. We, uh, I, I could, Kate, you sure you can do all this? And so a couple of last minute snags. She got me to, to cook for, for, for the, uh, the volunteers before we got started. And you before I could, e before <laughs> I could even get my spatula out, I had Will Carey and, and a couple other guys out there, you know, taking over the spatula and cooking dogs. And, but, uh, it was a great event. And I just want to, let her speak, but let me just kind of give you what, what was accomplished. And it's not just Sunday afternoon, but the, the days and well, days, you know, preceding and also still as we still finish up the, the playground, but mm -hmm. um, single day of service, 163 volunteers, mm -hmm. 1,015 service hours, 20,000 pounds of refuge picked up from the streets in, in Apopka. Yard and street cleanup from Hawthorne to Alabama, 7th, 8th, MA Board, and 6th to 6th. Cross streets, including 5th, Michael Gladden, Washington, Luann Street, etc. <laughs> the West Orange Trail cleanup. We had a veteran, veteran whose yard needed help. We got it cleaned up. Boy, I had a whole dumpster full of stuff out of that mm -hmm. house and yard uh, on 8th Street. Uh, Billy Dean Community Garden, we had a group out there cleaning up beds and getting ready to, you know, for, for planting there. Uh, 120 ferns that were potted uh, at, at, over uh, the chamber. Uh, still more to go. Got a bunch more over there to be planted. Uh, and as uh, Commissioner Velasquez talked about, Highland uh, Christian Academy, uh, a bigger project than they thought and still uh, hopefully it gets done, finished today maybe. Thursday, Close. I think. We think Thursday, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also a new uh, flower bed there. So, I mean, just an amazing uh, community coming together to really, you know, to, to support those that, that were in need and um, couldn't be more proud. And matter of fact, um, hopefully the, the chief will print, got a little thing I wanted to put in the chief that hopefully will be get printed tomorrow about, you know, what Apopka means to me. And, and this is the kind of thing that uh, I... I you know, that makes me want to, makes me proud of a pop and, and the people that live here. So, Kate, I don't know if you want to add, a, you know, anything to... <laughs> yeah, you uh, stole my report, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> that's okay. No, um, it, it was a collaboration with so many businesses mm -hmm. and nonprofits, and, you know, we've been working on the planning of this for months. Um, this is something that I did in the community that I was in before um, that we called St. Joe Serve, and uh, my friend flew out from home and came out and helped us because she knows how to help me with the recording of the hours and the sign-ins and things like that. We got you anyway, Diane. Somebody signed you in for Kiwanis. I know you went directly after Kiwanis over to <coughs> Heartland, so we were able to calculate everybody's hours um, so far. Um, we, including um, the team that's still working, so I stopped <laughs> with that. We'll, we will, um, the numbers will go up. And the reason there's a, something that you didn't mention, there's an economic impact that's recognized federally for this type of work when you um, do this many service hours as a community, especially revitalization and cleanup. So far, that is $29,282.75. So each hour per volunteer is valued at $28.85 per hour. And um, that's a pretty big deal, especially for a chamber that's fairly small in a community that's, you know, the fastest growing, however, um, you know, we're growing the chamber and we were able to do a lot of outreach that, um, you know, our, our chamber members are wonderful and ask us all the time, is there anything they can do? They wanna have a service project. The AMI Kids Project, I actually forgot to put on this report, is fantastic, it's really amazing in UPS and Fast Signs did that one and Coca-Cola and, um, gosh, Publix and, you know, of course, all the city workers. Mayor did get hustled into buying a bunch of hot dogs and grilling out for <laughs> us, so that was very cool. Um, I appreciate everybody for your participation, and we plan to do many more and launch a project out of it that, um, that the Coke team helped with called Planting a Popka, Embracing Our Growing Roots. So um, stay tuned for that. We're going to make sure that we 
get all of the businesses in town and organizations to plant um, and, and do a pledge. It's a partnership with Reimagine Community. She's on the board. And um, we're proud of that and just anything we can do to have outreach to our members and to the community, whether you're members or not, we, we are here to connect, lead, and serve. So I awesome. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Kate. Can I, I just mention also, which we didn't mention, was the month of March we did read around Apopka, which is something also that the chamber and all the businesses that participated, and uh, that was also very successful. Yeah. Um, and for my part, you know, I, I know that I had sponsored the museum because it was so important to bring foot traffic into the museum, and um, and it, it just really just snowballed from there. And uh, so again, I, I that also want to give you credit also for that. And Thank Shantae. You. Yeah, Shantae's um, initiative with the Read right. Around the City is just fantastic. And the chamber was proud to have right. those, you know, normally kids and families and grandparents, if they're not mm -hmm. in the chamber, they may not ever come over there. So it was right. really cool to be able to have them come in. And that's part of our initiative with the Business Advisory Council and also the Arts and Entertainment Council. Um, not only doing murals and cutouts and things that you know we're trying to put together funding for um, and get those launched because I think we're pretty close to launching that. Um, we don't have a ton of walls and stuff, but we have a ton of plazas and people want to participate. So we're doing some cutouts um, to be able to get you know a scavenger hunt going and things like that, um, just like other communities do, whether they have murals or other um, you know landmarks. And so. I appreciate the um, recognition. I was just a participant. You know, Shantae um, came up with that for the second time um, because I, she had a big one last year, and it was 2,000 students this year. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was really cool. And again, if you guys, you know, every time I get feedback or, or something and figure out, you know, what, our, what we're missing, and I try to connect mm -hmm. and see what we can do to bring it, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. So I appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, close the public hearing.